Uh, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Pascack Valley Regional High School District Board of Education meeting this Monday night, January the 18th. Uh, meeting regulations allow for two times for comments from the public, one closer to the beginning of the agenda, which allows for agenda items only. A second opportunity follows at the end of our agenda this evening for any topics that the public would like to comment on. So with that being said, the roll call. Ms. Bissinger. Here. Mr. Blundo. Here. Dr. Blundy. Here. Mr. Fronte. Mrs. Martin. Here. Ms. Molinelli. Present. Mr. Stankus. Here. Mrs. Varghese. Here. Mr. Weaver. Here. Very good. Please join me in the flag salute. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Both adequate and electronic notice of this meeting has been provided, specifying the time, place, and manner in which this notice was provided and by mailing copies of said notice to the record, filing copies of said notice with the municipal clerks of Hillsdale, Montvale, Rivervale, and Woodcliffe Lake and publishing said notice in the record on May the 29th, 2020 and October 23rd, 2020. As I mentioned before, there are two opportunities to be able to um, have the public speak at our meeting. If you are calling in, please press, press star nine. And if you would like to, um, join via Zoom, just raise your hand in the bottom of the, the Zoom. I don't know, it's at the very bottom, right? Yeah. Raise your hand. Uh, and just make sure to unmute yourself. Moving on to routine matters. Um, we have um, our student reps that are reporting. But before we get into their engaging, as always, presentations, <laughs> Dr. Gunderson, you have a report. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to share that Pascack Valley High School expects to reopen its doors tomorrow morning after being closed since January 5th. We are excited that we will be able to see our Pascack Valley students again and kick off the modified athletic season. Today, all staff participated in our annual Martin Luther King Jr. Professional Development Day. The theme of the day was connections, belonging, and relationships. Staff read responses to student writing prompts on the stated theme and participated in a variety of workshop activities. I have been engaged with fellow Bergen County superintendents in reaching out to Bergen County officials to organize educator vaccination sites throughout the county. Unfortunately, it seems as educators will have to wait a little bit longer to receive vaccinations, and I'm concerned that without a well-planned, well-thought-out distribution system for educators, the effort to vaccinate teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians, and secretaries will drag on longer than necessary. It is my belief that vaccinating educators will allow schools to be more readily attended to by our students and promote both educational as well as economic growth. Our work with scheduling for next year has started. As an administrative team, we look forward to sharing additional information on our effort to open up an additional coursework opportunity for students next year. In other words, we're hoping for students to be able to have an additional class period. More information will be forthcoming in the upcoming weeks as our administrative team interfaces with various board committees to make this hopefully a reality for our students. Please know that later in the meeting, I will be sharing the timeline for our upcoming Pascack Valley principal selection process, as well as sharing the 2021 board committee member lists. Thus concludes the superintendent's report for Monday, January 18th, 2021. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Aria, why don't you kick us off? Can you hear me? We can. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aria Shalile. I'll be presenting the Pascac Hill student report for the month of January. I'll begin with classroom items. To support Jack Silver, a junior at Pascac Hills who is currently battling leukemia and organizations recommended by hashtag Jack Strong, the student 
Government Association is hosting a school-wide Pathka Kills Kahoot game on Thursday, January 21st at 5.30 p.m. To participate in the trivia game, the student government is asking for a minimum donation of $5. All of the proceeds will be donated to organizations recommended by hashtag Jack Strong, including the Jillian Fund, MDS Foundation, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Trivia questions will test students' knowledge of Pathka Kills. For co-curricular items, in December, the Project Patterson Club collected 1,348 toys for their annual toy drive. Thank you to all those who donated to this amazing cause and brighten the holiday season for the students of the Community Charter School of Patterson. And congratulations to the Pasca Kills Model UN team for successfully participating in two virtual competitions over the past month. Jordana Brief, a sophomore at Hills, won an honorable mention at the Social Distancing Model UN competition. Hannah Baskin, Alana Mendard, and Riley Solomon collectively won four awards at the Virtual International Model UN Competition. And the Pascac Pioneer Robotics team hosted their first every ever Family Code Day coding event this afternoon, which hosted 12 families. During this event, student pioneers encouraged children aged from grades one to six and parents to work together and solve coding challenges while learning the fundamental parts of computer science. For athletic items, the Pathka Kills girls and boys basketball teams, wrestling team, track, and other winter sports have begun practicing for the winter season. We wish all winter sports teams good luck over the next few months. And congratulations to Aaron Kirkby, Pathka Kills softball coach, for earning a spot in North Jersey's top 40 power players of 2020 in recognition of her leadership and for being a supportive figure for Pathka Kills softball players, especially over the past year. And then for my joke of the day, why did the farmer only wear one boot to town? Oh. <laughs> he heard there would be a 50% chance of snow. <laughs> okay. That's good. okay. No pressure, Connor, for the joke of the day or anything. <laughs> Thank you, Ari. Hello, everyone. I will be giving Pathkeck Valley student report for the month of January, and we will start with classroom items. The Spanish National Honor Society adopted a family during the holiday season. With the combined efforts of all 22 members, the students were able to donate over $500 in gifts to a family in Cliffside Park facing hardship due to the pandemic, making their holiday season a little bit brighter. The PV student publication has published nearly 20 stories in its What's in Its Name package, exploring the use of Native, Native American mascots, interviewing people from all over the country and presenting a broader range of stories. The coverage team recently ran an article with the perspectives of teen journalists from the Navajo and Hopi nations in Arizona. The daily newspaper serving those reservations, the Navajo Hopi Observer, interviewed two of our journalists about their perspectives in putting together this series of articles. The What's in a Name package has been over a year in the making with more articles to come. On January 13th, the PV History Club hosted a guest speaker, Theodora Smiley Lacey, a civil rights activist and educator. Ms. Lacey was a personal friend of Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King helped organize the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. And upon moving to Teaneck was an integral part with peacefully integrating the Teaneck public schools. The event hosted by PV senior Danny Finch was attended by over 222 people. The club is advocating for a day of service this MLK day and hopes that Ms. Lacey's life story inspired many to know that a single person can make a difference. Co-curricular items. Pathkak Valley Junior Faith Machion will be holding a virtual event about honeybees on January 26th at 7 p.m. Faith hopes to spread awareness about her Girls Scout Gold Award project for saving the honeybees. Please join the virtual event on Zoom to learn more about the honeybee pr process, their importance, and why they are decreasing, and how we can help them. PV's Troop of International Thespian Society inducted eight new members during the virtual induction ceremony on Monday, January 11th. In December, ITS held its annual fundraiser for Broadway Cares and Equity Fights AIDS, raising over $200 to donate to this worthy cause. In addition, PV Theater held auditions for this year's spring musical, Little Shop of Horrors. They will be recording and filming the show in March and April and look forward to streaming many performances for the PV community in May. The last co-curricular item, the PV Val the Pascac Valley Interact Club members held a very successful toy drive, donating four large bags of toys to the Center for Hope and Safety in Hackensack University Medical Center. The club is currently in the process of planning their next community service project. 
Now we move on to athletic items. Congratulations to Jennifer Maloka for being the 2020-2021 Pasquac Valley recipient for the NJSIAA National Girls and Women in Sports Award. The NJSIAA recognizes the importance of promoting women in athletics and hosts an annual award ceremony to support this national movement. This is the 35th year of the ceremony and there's a way for, for providing well-deserved recognition to many of the finest athletes in the state. Pascac Valley recognizes Jennifer's outstanding leadership while participating on our swimming and girls lacrosse teams, as well as her success within the classroom. Congratulations to Desmond Von Topol for being named a 2020 New Jersey Mini Max winner sponsored by the Maxwell Football Club. Congratulations to Desmond on this remarkable achievement. And lastly, congratulations to Coach Jeff Jasper for being named the NorthJersey.com Top 40 Power Players of 2020. This is the ninth annual ranking recognized influential people within the athletic world in Northern New Jersey. Congratulations, Coach Jeff Jasper, on this wonderful accomplishment. For the fun fact, be on the lookout for the upcoming virtual Val Valley Cup trick shot competition. Students and staff will be invited to participate in this year's version of the competition. The winning individuals will earn points for their grades. Be sure to get involved and show off your best trick shot. And for the joke of the day, why doesn't the sun go to college? Because it has a million degrees. Thus concludes my report to the Board of Education for January 2021. Connor, did you say the trick shot was uh, open also to teachers and administrators? Yes. Very nice. In all seriousness, I would, I would like to comment on, on both of your reports. Um, you highlight a number of student activities that are continuing to operate remotely. Um, and it really makes me you know, proud to know that we have so many of our student activities going on this school year. When I listen to so many of my colleagues, many of them have talked about how they curtailed student activities in the beginning of the school year because they didn't know how those activities would continue on. It's a real testament to our students and our advisors and coaches alike who have really thought of creative ways to keep students engaged because as a parent of a, of a high school junior myself who doesn't happen to go to this district, it's a little bit difficult to keep students engaged and motivated when they have to be home as much as they have to be right now. So it's a testament to, uh, to you and your, uh, your fellow students for keeping motivated and continuing to participate in some of those activities. Well done. Moved. Somebody's mic isn't on. <laughs> I would say that's not a bad thing, uh, Mr. Stankus. <laughs> All right, there we go. Here you Moving on. Okay, so routine matters. We had it first and second. Are there any um, any discussion? Yes. Ms. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Blundo. Yes. Dr. Blundy. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Yes. Ms. Molinelli. Yes. Mr. Stankus. Yes. Mrs. Varghese. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. Very good. Uh, moving on to presentations. Uh, this evening we have math, the mascot committee presentation update, the, the procedural update. And we're going to be starting with um, Hills, uh, Alexa Sipos, and Jacob Levin. The mic is yours. Uh, thank you. Our mascot selection committee is made up of roughly 11 or 12 faculty members, as well as students from all walks of life at Pascac Hills, student government, athletics, drama, and other various clubs and organizations. These individuals were selected to advocate for the groups they represent, in part to create a comfortable environment for all members of the committee and receive input from all facets of the school to create a better, more inclusive result. We are of the belief that the students selected are honored and excited to be able to be a part of this creative process and to make a change that will positively impact not only ourselves, but the school as a whole presently and in the years to come. I know I am. 
Uh, overall, as representatives of the student body, we're grateful for the opportunity to voice our ideas and inspirations in the hopes of a brighter future with a mascot we can all rally behind. So to start off the mascot decision-making process, Mr. Paspal has sent out a Google form survey to the rest of the committee. And this survey basically instructed each member to type in their first, second, and third mascot choice, along with a rationale explaining as to why each of those mascots could be suitable for our school. This survey also included a new logo design each member possibly had in mind. The committee was advised that their mascot proposal should of course represent toughness, courage, and grit, but are also inclusive to everyone so everyone feels safe at Hills. With this form, the team was allowed to present their ideas privately without the pressure of their peers maybe disagreeing with them in a group setting. We have received a number of results and to continue the hunt for our new mascot, a meeting will be held this Wednesday, January 20th, so that the team can analyze their results. During that meeting, the committee will all come together to decide the top three most popular mascot options from that survey, and then of course finalize for a school-wide vote. Overall, this process thus far has been easy and effective, and we are so excited to present three new mascot options for our school to choose from, and of course pick one we can all stand behind. It is such an amazing opportunity for the student body to even be allowed to take part and have a say in this selection. So on behalf of Hills and especially the mascot committee, we thank you. And we're just all really excited to unveil our new mascot. Very good, thank you. And for, let's see, Pascat Valley, we have Delia Collis and Vasily Karwelich. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Karlevich. Ah, thank you. Okay, you guys are up. Good evening, everyone. So far, our committee has had one meeting on January 7th. I will explain the procedures that we set up in that first meeting, and then Delia will discuss our goals moving forward. Our committee is made up of 68 members, and it is meant to be a sample of our school population. There's a combination of 15 coaches and teachers, who are spread out across all 12 departments. There are 53 students in our committee who represent every single sport and virtually every club that is offered at Pasquet Valley from ice hockey and football to bowling and golf. And if a sport like soccer has a girls and boys team, then one girl would represent the girls team and one boy would represent the boys team. In terms of clubs, we have representation from theater, robotics, DECA, Camp Raspberry, and more. The presidents and vice presidents of the executive and class councils were also invited to the committee as well. Students who were invited to the committee were nominated by a coach or advisor, and many students were very honored to be part of the committee. And that shows in our attendance with 64 out of the 68 members attending the first meeting. And those who didn't attend sent emails to Mr. Buchanan to meet privately and discuss the meeting at a later date. Just like Hills, we will be nominating three mas three mascots to be voted on by the student body and faculty. The committee also agreed that the new mascot shouldn't represent a group of people and it should be A, positive and inclusive in nature, B, promote school pride and excitement, and C, portray strength, toughness, competitiveness, grit, togetherness, excellence, history, fairness, and compassion. We would also like to make clear that our school colors are not changing and that also we were just nominating the mascot name and the logo will be a completely separate process that will take place after we, the student body and faculty has voted on a mascot name. Additionally, everyone on the committee has an equal poll and the same voice. We understand that we were all selected for a reason and that we should focus on picking a mascot that best represents our teams and clubs. With that said, I'm now going to hand it off to Delia to discuss our second meeting and our goals moving forward. Hi, thanks Vasily. Um, our next meeting will take place on January 21st. And as Vasily said, we'll be going into the meeting with the list of possible mascots. This meeting, if we're not all virtual, will take place in the auditorium on Thursday at 3.30. Students who are virtual um, will not be left out and a Zoom link will be provided so that they can share and join in our discussion. Um, these past few days, members of the committee have been holding discussions with the, group, the groups that they represent and will nominate up to three mascot suggestions by the next, by the next meeting on Thursday. 
Ideally, in the second meeting, we will come up with the top three mascots for a school-wide vote. However, more time may be needed to narrow down the options. So a third meeting may be scheduled um, to discuss, to continue discussions. We would like to generate descriptions for each mascots to, for each mascot we vote for so students can understand our rationale in selecting each logo as well as the pros and cons. During our meeting, we, we emphasize to each members to each member that privacy will be respected and needs to be respected in order to create a safe and comfortable environment for members to share their views. Since we understand that this is such a sensitive topic, members are also reminded to be advocates for the groups that they represent. By creating a sample for each sports and clubs team in the school um, with representatives of both students and teachers, we hope that our mascot will be something students can really get behind for decades to come. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. Do my colleagues have any questions for the students? Yeah, I have one. Um, so I love, you know, three, three logos are, and their mascots are gonna be presented and the student bodies are gonna vote on them. And I guess my question has to do with that tally, meaning if there's no clear cut majority, um, you know, it's 33, 33, 33. Would, would we do, I mean, I don't know who makes these rules, but would we do an elimination of the low vote getter and need a, a majority because I would hate something to be chosen that, you know, is only 34%. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have the answer for that, but I'd, I'd be curious to find out if the, if the students would like to chime in on, on the response to that answer. Good question. Yeah, sure. So, so a minimum of 51% would be required Perfect. for a mascot to be selected on the school-wide vote. However, we are discussing internally whether a greater majority may be needed, and we're trying to balance the fact that we want you know, the whole school could be behind a mascot while also realizing that this process can't take forever. Yep. I don't know Perfect. if you were asking, um, my apologies, the uh, Pasco Valley students or as well uh, our students, but the logo will not be voted on uh, by the student body until uh, there are later procedures. It will be modeled uh, for our school off of the uh, choice that will be dictated to student body vote. Uh, the logo will be determined at a later date. Yeah, so Jacob, that, that's a very good point as well, right? So um, certainly to, for the first question, if there are three, there will be three choices. If there isn't one that has a full majority, there'll be a runoff vote between the top two, uh, as Vasily mentioned. And then Jacob is making the important distinction, I believe, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, this is not what you mean, um, that the mascot itself is different than the logo. So the yeah. mascot will be voted on first, and then right. we'll go through a process with different renderings for that mascot and then you'll go through a similar process, I believe, correct? That is correct. Great. Good. Um, I have a question. When you mentioned that this Wednesday they were going to be presented, what was the time and how was that going to be presented again? I think it said for Hills. The 20th and the 21st was what I heard as the two days for each school respectively. Yeah, so, so I know that uh, I think Vasily mentioned that uh, Pascac Valley would be on the 21st at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Pascac Hills, is, the, is that a correct assumption as well, 3.30 or after school? I believe, yes. um, yeah. Sometime after school. Right. Is that going to be recorded just so we can go back and, and look at it, or is it just a live all these, Zoom? All these meetings are private, and we don't want, we don't want certain members to feel, you know, we don't, we don't want, we want like a sense of privacy. And so let's just say a member brings up an idea. We don't want the community to see that and criticize that member. We want to make a group decision. Likewise, we want an open discussion. We don't want our members to feel pressured to behave in a certain way or not behave. We should be all behaving appropriately, but we should all be um, feel comfortable enough to vocalize our suggestions. answer your question do you need clarification yeah, so, so it's going to be it's just meetings that are enclosed with the group of individuals that were picked i'm just trying to understand so so the individuals that were picked i think you said 11 to 12 students for pasca hills there was going to be i think you said 68 members for valley it's enclosed you guys presented to those members then it will be voted on and then we will we will be told what the three options are correct, correct. The, the students yeah. from pasca how, how many students are involved 
Yeah, a small correction. Uh, it's 11 or 12 uh, faculty members and then um, a large amount of students, I believe about 34. Thanks. So there's approximately 60 to 70 members on each of the two high schools that are uh, a diverse grouping of people that are making the decisions in regards to the three logos and the one they like the best. I think uh, the students uh, both said, I don't know about up, upwards of 70, but at Pascac Hills, it sounds like a little bit less than 50, right? But um, okay. population wise, Pascac Hills is a little bit smaller, but a, um, a cross section was selected from various athletic activities as well as co-curricular organizations as well from what the students said. Is that a correct uh, statement? Yes. Just a quick question. Um, are did both of you, uh, both schools, use a survey or form? Um, I believe both schools used a form. As of right now, a form has just been sent out to like the members of the committee. And okay. I think both schools are planning on sending out a form to the student body. And the purpose of that is just to generate an initial list that we could discuss in the meeting. Right. Okay. And, and could uh, maybe one or two of you um, describe what the process is like for a student on the committee? How does the committee member generate ideas? Is the idea that you alone generate those ideas? Or I think it was referenced before that it's a little bit more than that. Who do you solicit or how do you solicit ideas for mascots? Yeah, so everyone was selected for a reason and it's because they represent one club or one sport. And as a committee member, it is their responsibility to have discussions with their selective groups and then to come, to come together to choose a decision and to nominate three names together. So it's not, it's not supposed to just be one person, it's supposed to be a representation from all the clubs. Uh, similarly, um, we are uh, lucky enough to have a lot of students who do a lot of different activities at Pascal Kills. Um, so they may not necessarily have been leaders who were nominated, but we have uh, students from uh, all different uh, extracurriculars and they were asked to have discussions uh, with anyone in any of their extracurriculars or in their various friend groups um, and, you know, brainstorm a, a short list. Um, and then we were asked to select um, our top three favorites and provide a rationale um, and uh, anything else we would like to add of note uh, and submit that into our Google form, which will be again submitted to the committee and we will meet as a committee and we will vote on which ones we as a committee think are the best. Can I ask a question about the students? Was this student driven or are the teachers guiding this and giving you suggestions or are they just there to help in the process? Yeah, the teachers are just meant to facilitate the discussion and we, all, we want to emphasize that all 68 members have an equal poll and they have the same voice. So you know, one member is bigger in, than another. Uh, we, we, our teachers are participating in our discussion, um, but we do have a lot more students than we do teachers. Um, so though they might all have an equal vote, all the teachers have an equal vote, the same as the student, we do have a lot more students than we do have teachers. And um, because the teachers are also going to be uh, represented by this uh, mascot and this logo in, in the years to come. Um, again, sorry for the confusion, the logo will not be voted on at this time. Um, but we do want our teachers to have a, a voice and a vote, so they will be a part of this discussion. However, they will not be determining the outcome. Uh, colleagues, any other additional questions? Mike, welcome. Okay. Um, so I don't have any questions for the committee, but we can return to this later and have conversation, correct? Uh, we uh, under new business or old business, absolutely. Great, thank yeah. you. My pleasure. So we open it up now to comments of the uh, from the public. Comments uh, may be directed specifically to agenda items only at this time. And so you may raise your hand in the Zoom uh, format, or if you're on the call, hit star nine. Uh, make sure to unmute yourself and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. 
for the students who are presenting, thank you very much. You're free to go. Uh, we very much appreciate you spending the time this evening to update the board. And we will see you back here uh, in not too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you so much. So as Ms. Molinelli articulated, you can click on the raised hand, or if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine, and that will raise your hand. And the first person is someone we haven't heard from in a little while, Ms. Carolee Adams. Ms. Adams, I will activate you in one moment here. Ms. Adams, you should be able to speak. How are you? Uh, a hopeful new year to you all. And I'm just going to give you a quick quote by Martin Luther King that's important to my family and I, and he basically wrote it from the Birmingham City County Jail. And he said, it was, uh, you know, we'll re we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. So what a blessing it is to be able to talk so freely as we all can. And I guess as we consider all that's on the agenda is that the freedom to give our input will be valuable to the future of our student body and all of the um, taxpayers of um, the four sending towns. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Now, the young people who spoke, they sound very mature. They are mature, I'm sure. Uh, but I wonder whether or not in the course of their discussion, because this was one of my concerns about the mascots was the cost. And I had even written uh, and asking for uh, the replies from two former board members about the cost. And I never got such a reply. There was no freedom in that discussion. Um, so that I'm, I'm wondering, because these are future taxpayers, is whether or not in the discussion of all of the changes that may or may not occur, that they're aware of the cost of these changes. And I do not know who the advisors are for these committees, but I do think that that's an important part of what they should know as uh, you know, they're gonna be starting to vote when they're 18, their parents are paying the taxes, but so I'm asking you whether or not you could consider that in their discussions, they are aware of the costs of all of these changes. So Ms. Adams, I appreciate that, uh, that suggestion and I will certainly discuss that with the, uh, the two athletic directors to see if that's something that should be mentioned to the students. It is important to note though that um, this change will be taking place. And so, you know, to bring up the idea of cost at this time doesn't mean that the student groups are going to go ahead and say, we're going to revert back to what we were last year. So um, the intent is to move forward, but I do believe that this Board of Education is probably going to have a little bit of the discussion also about the projected cost. That information has been shared with the board. So we are fully aware of what the costs are and uh, I appreciate your- I'm not. I don't think we were ever told what the cost would be. No, what I'm suggesting is if you stick around to the end of the board meeting, you might get to hear that. Thank you very much, Dr. Gunderson. Thank you all. Nice hearing from you again. I'll be back. Councilman Roche. Good evening. How are you this evening? Hey, thanks um, so much. For thanks for having us. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I just had a quick question as far as how the committees operate, um, be it uh, collectively or individually. It seems like it's two committees, one for each school, which I understand from uh, some perspective, but is there anything to kind of join the two schools together as we are one district? Um, you know, what, what I don't, what I hate to see is for, you know, let's say the Hills to come up with three cat names and Valley to come up with three dog names for you know lack of a better description but you know <laughs> I'm assuming they're looking for something that's a little more joint between the two schools I know there was a um, there was some discussion at one point about having one mascot to represent the district for uh, clubs and sports that have only one team so I'm just wondering what collective is yeah. for the two groups yeah. That's, a, that's certainly a valid question. There is no uh, directive to make sure that the two mascots that are selected have a connection to one another. And part of that comes down to the voting process. So we're really focusing on what is best and what represents the student body at each of the two schools. And to try to have three 
mascots that are generated for Pascack Valley and then three mascots that are generated for Pascack Hills mm -hmm. and then have those top selections of those three be related to one another, I think was really, uh, logistically really difficult. So we're really focusing on what the student body feels best represents them. Um, and you heard that the criteria or the expectations for both of those committees were similar yet a little bit different. Uh, I think the students did a nice job of articulating what the what the qualities or characteristics are in the mascots. Uh, and that's really what we're focused on right now. We have had some discussion as an administrative team about also having a district wide mascot. We don't believe that students necessarily rally around the district nearly as much as they rally around their school identity. So uh, the district teams will not have a separate mascot. I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Oh, yep. Mr. DeRosa, come on up. Can't forget about the people that are here in person. <laughs> <laughs> can hear you over the road of the crowd. Um, <laughs> could you just take us from now to the ultimate decision? Is it February's meeting or one of February's meeting where the students present to the board and then the board takes that decides in February or is there more to a process? So we don't have a firm deadline because we've tried to be flexible for the constant opening and closing of the schools. Right. So I think it was Pascack Valley that um, was closed a little bit more right before the holidays. So they pushed off the, the two student committee group meetings until right after the holidays. They were originally slated to be before the holidays, but I think actually both schools were closed at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so that pushed off the process a little bit. I'm hoping that by the middle to end of February, we will have a recommendation from each of the two student groups for this board. Um, and once the board approves what the students recommend, then those student groups will move forward as well with um, with various renderings for what the actual logo right. will look like. So do you anticipate making a, a decision when the students present that night or is there is there going to be more discussion or I think that'll be have, that'll have to be something that Ms. Molinelli, the board and I discuss uh, whether the board is ready that evening when it's presented to them to affirm what the students are looking for in a mascot or if the board feels that they need to um, postpone or um, have a vote at another time. Okay. So we can get back to you on that. All right, all right. Could you just briefly explain why you felt it was important to have the decision-making internal as far as faculty and student as opposed to soliciting out public, you know, members of the residents? Sure. So we did a lot of work looking for other school districts in the area that have changed their mascots. and probably to no one's surprise, there aren't too many school districts that have done this recently. We're blessed. Um, so interestingly enough, the Nyack School District right across the border decided a little bit over a month or two after we had decided to abandon or retire our mascots, decided to do the same thing with their Indian mascot as well. Nyack moved a little bit more quickly with the process that they introduced. And so I've been in touch with the superintendent of the Nyack Public Schools and our athletic directors have been in touch with their athletic, der athletic director who's spearheading the effort. And we had a lot of communication about how much do you involve the community? Do you not involve the community? And really the sentiment was the mascot is really supposed to be a rallying cry for the students to rally around and be proud of. And so really it should focus on our students. And the more we spoke with some students, and consider this, we recognize that it's such a flashpoint issue for people in the community that the people that are going to get involved are not necessarily going to be as uh, productive in what comes next as the students would be. So we decided to focus on the students and also for a whole variety of logistical challenges involving the community at this time in these discussions would also be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really the only input, the only opportunity for residents to have input is really these these next couple of meetings. Absolutely, right. absolutely. So when the students present uh, the next time and they review what the top three selections are for uh, each of the schools, it's a great opportunity for members of the public to either chime in during the meeting, send an email, reach out to me directly. However they would like to do that, they're welcome okay. to. And I think you've done a good job using social media 
to announce what the agenda items are. I'm sure in the next couple of meetings, you'll be sure to include that. I appreciate that. Yes, we are, we are trying to put a full court press uh, every time we have a meeting. And also, I have to say that the trailblazer and the smokes are the publication previously known as the smoke signal, right. the TV student publication, have done a great job updating their school communities on the progress that we're making here. So I'm sure that the more information to follow with those publications as well. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Eric, just a comment on the councilman's comments, and I know we don't have to decide it now, but it, it struck me that we, we should really consider not making a decision on that night. Uh, I just think it's a, I think we should all take our time and think about it and not hear for the first time that we're going to be the wombats and make a decision on that. I, so that's just my opinion. Obviously, we can talk about it later. Definitely. One thing I think that we've really committed to is that there's not going to be a decision until every board member that sits on this council and all of our colleagues are really comfortable with the decision. This is, we went into this knowing that we weren't going to try and shove it down anyone's throat that this was going to be a very mindful opportunity for, you know, in certain circumstances, 68 people to come to the table to represent 68 different organizations. So each student not just represents themselves, but the organizations mm -hmm. that they are connected with. So when, when this board is ready to make a decision amongst our colleagues, that's when we'll make the decision. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, there is another comment from the public. Appreciate your patience. Kathy Connolly. Yep. Kathy Connolly, I think either I lowered your hand by mistake or you lowered your hand. Kathy Connolly, would you like to speak? Just raise your hand again and if you'd like to speak. Hold on one second. I think she dropped off completely. Okay, maybe she can join us. She can join us at the end, the end if yeah. you'd like to. Okay, okay. Uh, any other comments from the, our colleagues? Very good. All right, moving on to policy, we have two consent agenda items. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second? Okay. Jim, uh, any comments? I do have a question on number two, school calendar. So Dr. Gunderson, you had you'd made reference in your board uh, in your superintendent's report just to the, the rollout of the vaccine for educators. Um, in looking at the way the calendar falls this year with the Labor Day and the, the holidays, not knowing what is going to transpire medically between now and the beginning of the school year, was any thought given to possibly pushing back the start of the school year to allow for more time until that maybe Monday the 13th. I know that then pushes back the school year, uh, but because of the way those days are stacked, I think we'd only be pushing the year to like the 22nd. Um, again, it is a, it is a not questioning the calendar, just asking if there was any thought given to that. There was no specific thought given to vaccine distribution. It's certainly our hope that um, staff members are going to be vaccinated well in advance of the beginning of next school year. That's certainly our hope also that if students, if students are able to be vaccinated, that that process will be taking place over the summer and perhaps into the fall. Um, I don't believe, not that I have anything specific to back it up, but I don't necessarily believe that the, the start of the school year um, will really play a factor into um, the vaccination process. I will admit that this is a very bizarre beginning of the school year next year with Labor Day weekend and the Jewish holidays immediately following that Labor Day weekend. But as we know from, from previous discussions years ago, when we made a conscious effort to shift the school year to start before Labor Day, it's for a variety of different reasons. It's high school students, many of them are back for fall athletics anyway, so they are already in school, if you will. We are trying to front load instructional days prior to when students take those high stakes exams, such as AP exams. Uh, we know that 
large parts of the rest of the country start in the middle of August and therefore also get a leg up on our students with instructional days prior to those big assessments. Mm -hmm. And then we also know that students at the end of June are starting to participate in college orientation programs, Boys and Girls State, and other opportunities for students. So that's why we made that conscious decision to start the school year a little bit earlier than some of our uh, neighboring school districts. I would like to add that this calendar, as always, is agreed to um, um, and worked out in collaboration with our other regions, uh, Region 2 school districts. Um, not necessarily an identical start and end date, but the major school breaks are virtually identical to make sure that there's an opportunity for families to go away with similar vacation schedules. Eric, um, while the conversation was happening, uh, the thought that I had was the current regulations are that if you go to one of the uh, red states, and I don't mean that politically, uh, the hot states, um, you have to quarantine. At, it's 15 days. I don't know if it was lowered to 10. Four, uh, this, that, that's another issue. I think the CDC is, issue, has yes. lowered it to 10, what New Jersey is right now. And I, I just want to, you know, in the summer, if things are better, people are going to start traveling more. And I think we need to be crystal clear that whatever our start date is, people need to be aware of whatever the current quarantine is. Because if people are taking vacation till the middle of August um, and then they're out of state and then we're coming back, I don't even know what the date is, uh, you know, before the end of August. Just want to be aware of that and make sure we're, we over communicate to folks that, you know, if you're out of state in one of those uh, hot states, uh, you need to be aware of whatever the rule is at that time. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. I had a separate question. Um, I know that you guys piloted those half days for the professional development where they were coming in late. And I noticed now we're transitioning back to more of a traditional leaving early. Was there a reason for that shift? Um, so there's we would like to incorporate the early dismissal days for professional development again. We can do that after we approve this calendar. And what we decided to do this year was because of the hybrid schedule and all students have to vacate the building prior to lunchtime, we decided not to engage with um, many of those half-day professional development days in order to maximize student time in classrooms, even if it's virtual. Um, next year, there's enough of a question mark out there about what exactly the structure will look like if we'll be able to have lunch in the buildings that we decided not to put those early dismissal days on the calendar. And maybe we can all be surprised in September and we can put three or four of them on there uh, if we feel we need it and if we feel like we will be more back to normal. But to your point, those half day, those early dismissal days for professional development have been really, um, I'm sorry, not early dismissal, late arrival days um, have been really beneficial to, uh, to our staff members in prior years. I also had a question on the first one with the travel. And again, I'm not familiar with the individual teacher contracts, but it seems that one of the members of the three that are requesting uh, travel pre-authorization, it seems like the workshop is on, happening on Friday and Saturday, but she's staying over till Sunday. Is there a reason for that? And the, also the, uh, it was $70 a day for travel expenses in addition to the hotel or was that for parking so so first of all i'm not optimistic that this uh conference will actually take place in person um, and we checked into this and made sure that there are no cancellation fees whether it's for the hotel or the registration but in order to be proactive and if things get better um, these individuals will be approved to go. And you're absolutely right. The one individual there who has a hotel stay, I believe, that I believe is an officer in that organization. And so it behooves them to be there. And also for that particular individual, it's part of their collective bargaining agreement that they can do that. Good question. Any additional questions? Okay, yeah. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Blundo. Yes. Dr. Blundy. Yes. Mr. Fronte. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Ms. Molinelli. Yes. Mr. Stankus. Yes. Mrs. Varghese. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. 
Moving on to education, we've got three ag consent agenda items. May I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. <laughs> Very good. Any Seeing none, yeah. Just one question about the tuition oh, student. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. That tuition student that's coming in, will there be any additional staff needed? Uh, no, not at this time. Any other comments? Yeah. Ms. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Blundo. Yes. Dr. Blundy. Yes. Mr. Fronte. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Ms. Molinelli. Yes. Mr. Stankus. Yes. Mrs. Varghese. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. Very good. Moving on to human resources with six consent agenda items. May I have a motion? So move. Second. 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 Okay. Any comments? Very good. Yes. Ms. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Blundo. Yes. Dr. Blundy. Yes. Mr. Fronte. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Ms. Molinelli. Yes. Mr. Stankus. Yes. Mrs. Varghese. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. Very good. Uh, moving on to finance with five consent agenda items. May I have a motion? I'll move it. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any comments under finance? Just a quick question on number three, um, the swim agreement. Is that for practices or meets? That is for meets. It's for meets? Yes. And we, no payment if no meets happen? That is correct. Thanks. Very good. Yeah. Ms. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Blundo. Yes. Dr. Blundy. Yes. Mr. Fronte. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Ms. Molinelli. Yes. Mr. Stankus. Yes. Mrs. Varghese. Yes. Mr. Weaver. Yes. Okay, moving on to old business. Tammy, I have a couple of things. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to uh, compliment the administration. Uh, one of the things I was going to bring up, and I think it's old, not new, was are we getting ahead of year-end celebrations? Uh, <laughs> and I have to tell you, you know, last year we didn't know anything until March 13th, and it was a scramble. This year, we do have some thing. We realize things can change, but I was very happy, and I don't know how much you can share publicly, Eric, but I was very happy to see that the administration has a plan uh, for traditional senior year-end activities. I know it's already starting to creep up a little bit on social media, and uh, <laughs> Kristen and I saw that, and I, I didn't want to say too much, but I wanted to say they're on it, you know, so <laughs> thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yes, last year it was, a, I think, a challenge would be an understatement. Right. Um, and it's amazing, though, how after the December holidays, how quickly your mindset shifts from just getting the school year up and running to, oh, no, we need to get ready for the end of the school year now in January. Yep. Um, so I have to give a lot of credit to our building administrators who are really on top of this, working closely with the PFA and PFO. Uh, things are in progress. And um we're cautiously optimistic that we will be able to have somewhat of modified yet normal year-end activity. So Great. thank you. So the other item is a little more, um, well, it's educational. Uh, back a few months ago, David Steinberg, former board member, brought up our um, trending AP exams in science and how they were trending in the wrong direction as opposed to some of the other APs that were holding their own. When you look at the Department of Ed 2019 test results, um, we're not looking very good at all. Um, it's for Pascag Valley, only 39% are coming in as uh, proficient. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, and at Hills, it's even worse, it's 38%. Now, before I ask my question or make my point, 
I realize, and some of the new members may or may not know this, that in 2019, some of these tests were optional and there was a big movement. I don't want to take it. I'm not going to give it much thought. And I, I do agree that that may have made those numbers lower. However, when you look at our peer schools and in our geographic area and you look at Old Japan, uh, Northern Valley in general, and you look at Westwood and Park Ridge, they're in the fi high 50s and the 60s and we're we're under 40. So my now my question or my point is, understanding there are factors are we looking at this specifically and is there an action plan to address this because that's two indicators in this in this uh subject matter that are not going and i, I do have to i'm not going to name her name a resident brought this to my attention and she was spot on um so it wasn't me like looking for trouble somebody brought it to me and i thought she was right so i wanted to bring it up yeah thank you i if uh, if you refer to the october 26th uh, Board of Education meeting, Dr. Backenheimer presented on our standardized test scores at that time. And he demonstrated that our AP scores are getting better and better year over year, as well as our SAT scores. Now, last year, there was no state testing as a result of what took place um, with uh, the quarantine at that time. And you're absolutely right, Mr. Blundo, those, that science test that was administered was a test that did not count for anything, and our students knew that. And several years ago, the prior president of the Board of Education made it very clear that this board found that standardized test, that standardized test to be a waste of time for our students, and students should instead be preparing for their SATs and AP score uh, tests as well. In addition to that, for some period of time, this Board of Education is focused on the importance of educational experiences that don't necessarily get measured in standardized test scores. Admittedly, standardized test scores are important, but they're not the end all and be all to the educational experience. I have had conversations with Dr. Backenheimer as recently as last week about a variety of different standardized test scores, including, because I do know that there's some chatter on social media, about that, um, I think, environmental science um, um, assessment. Um, we, he is looking into it. He is in conversation with the science supervisor, but I would like to find out, maybe not this evening, but in future conversations with this board, particularly those board members that are going to be on the curriculum committee, to reevaluate this board and see how critical it is to this board that our students are prepared for standardized tests versus the focus that we've been having, which is what we believe are really good educational experiences to help students get prepared for 21st century careers and educational opportunities. Uh, I, I feel strongly, uh, I'm an alum, by my training, I'm a physicist and engineer, as you are, Eric, you're a physicist. Um, I'm aware of this, uh, what Mr. Blondo is speaking of. I, my general philosophy is, we as board members, many of us are parents, either of students currently in the district or previously in the district. And I truly believe that we're, it's a partnership of the students, the parents, uh, the whole faculty and administration, as well as we the board members. I truly believe it's a four-way partnership. So I don't want to point fingers. That's not right. Because I think we all share in some responsibility. But I, I think we need to get these numbers up because uh, many uh, people who study various disciplines are considered smart people, and certainly those kids who focus on science are included within those. So I, I feel strongly that our numbers should come up because why would we have taken it any different than any other district? That's that's the one point where I, I'm going to say that I, I don't agree with is that I agree that it was, not uh, I'm sure we didn't take it overly uh, critical, but I'm sure other districts might have felt the same way. And, and, I, and because the numbers are so different, when you look at the 30s and you look at the 50s and the 60s, it's substantial. And, and yeah, I don't want to witch hunt. I just want to help make it better, whatever it is we can do to make it better. But I think we're better than that uh, as a team. And I think we should try to figure out what we can do to help. Uh, and, and maybe the best thing to do, frankly, is just ask the department, how can we help you? Like the Jerry Maguire, I know it sounds silly, but help me help you. Tell us, what, how can we empower them better if there's something that they don't have, that they need, or 
they're not getting from the students. Maybe uh, I don't. Again, we're not pointing fingers here. That we need to facilitate that and do everything we can. It's important. You know, we hear we hear STEM and all these things all the time, and it's very important. But then I think we need to. I think we need. I think we need to focus on it because I think. Well, Mr. Blondo, it's the second time we're hearing about this, and you know how I was, because I was the one who kind of bubbled it up uh, with the standardized tests and then with the AP scores. And I'm in a long here myself, as are my kids, so I feel very strongly about getting that correct. Sure. The, the so, other thing, if I could just mention, too, is I'd like to know if our curriculum's equivalent with the other districts, meaning are we teaching apples to apples, and does that affect the end result of the test scores? So the curriculum that we teach as opposed to the other districts would be interesting as well. So I will make sure that Dr. Backenheimer addresses this with the curriculum committee so you can have some time to really look into the data. We can reevaluate and I'm sorry, revisit um, that test particularly and talk about how there was the opt out um, practice that was widely taken advantage of in this district. But more importantly, we'll take a hard look at the curriculum talk about how we are up to date on our curricular efforts, and we'll look at other measures of assessment as well, whether it's SAT2s, whether it's AP scores, what have you. We'll, we'll make sure that the board feels comfortable with where we are, and if we find out that we are not up to the levels that we would like to be, that we have a plan in place to get better. You know, I appreciate your comments, Mike, and everybody, you know, your comments, Tammy. Um, I would never advocate teaching to the test. But 38 percent, when somebody comes in and says, what's this high school I'm going to move into this community about? And it's not about property values, but, you know, I want to look at this school and I want and wow, their science. And to, to Mike's point is so much lower than all the others. I would that said, I'll repeat. I don't think we need to teach to the test, but I think we have to evaluate it and see exactly as Mike said. What can we do? In a balance. Um, I would just like to say, as being on the curriculum committee, I spent a lot of time looking at the uh, results. I actually downloaded the whole spreadsheet of all the test results uh, for that year. And, uh, you know, we're going to look into it, definitely. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that catches my mind on this is that both schools scored lower than other surrounding districts. Usually you see one, you say, okay, one is one way and the other is lower. And there's a difference and you can assume, okay, maybe it uh, has to do with the school, but it seems to me to lean towards more of a curriculum thing. And that's where, you know, I think the curriculum committee has to uh, really, you know, um, look at it. And, and see what uh, what can be done, you know. Now I know there uh, there are things in the works, so um, I'm encouraged by that. And uh, we are going to be moving forward with it, and I expect that things will be dealt with properly. So. Okay. Very good. You know, may, if I could add something, maybe we could have. A representative from the department come talk to us and and share their challenges and and their vision and and, and moving forward at, at the appropriate time yeah i think at the appropriate time that makes sense i think the first uh step is to to have this discussion with the curriculum committee yeah which is I'm comprised, honest, so yeah. right yeah. i think that makes a lot of sense and then it's together as a committee if you feel that the entire board should hear a presentation or be involved in a in a conversation we can go ahead and do that and the community should know we have a unified front we agree on how we're going to address it yeah of course um just to kind of change the old topic here but i did uh, have two people reach out to me regarding the news brief and they were highly excited about the internship highlight. So I wanted to uh, just say that that has not gone unnoticed by the community and it is getting out there and people were very happy to see that. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. That was one of the efforts of the communications committee, I think, right? To, uh, and the post-secondary uh, education committee as well to get that message out there about the positive experiences that our students are having out there. So. Thank you for bringing up and for sharing those sentiments. Was there, 
Yes, old business. Was there going to be some continued discussion about the mascot that Mike, you wanted to have? I wanted to create some space to chat about that. That would be great. So, you know, the, the topic of the mascot, we, we certainly as candidates, as, as uh, school board members, were asked that question uh, often in the lead up to the election. And I, I think it's safe to say, though, I don't want to speak for anyone else who ran that um, we did not run for the purpose of being able to have input on the school mascots. I, I know and speaking for myself, I have four children who will be going through the system over the next 12 years. And, uh, you know, assuming this responsibility is much more than about mascots, though the process is important. Um, and while I have not had the opportunity to offer a perspective as a board member, now that we are moving through the process, um, I do feel that that's necessary so that the community understands where I stand uh, going forward. So as we look to move forward, uh, I would like to take a moment to reflect on how we've gotten to this point of discussing new mascots. On June 22nd, 2020, the Pascac Valley Regional Board of Education voted unanimously to retire the Valley and Hills mascots. That there would be action taken on this topic was not communicated to the public, and that it would even be discussed was not widely known, with the agenda for that meeting noting there would be conversation about mascots on page 26 of a 26-page agenda. Since 95% of the conversation that night was focused on the Indian mascot, the board member making the motion was asked to clarify before the vote if this included the cowboy and responded, yeah, because the cowboy itself is also non-inclusive. When I reached out to the board, I asked on what climate surveys or research was that conclusion based? It did not receive a response. There were references made to climate surveys and that decision making was based in part on these surveys. It would have been helpful for the public to see the results of these surveys to better understand the board's decision making process in labeling cowboys as non-inclusive. Following the board vote, since I did not get an answer to that question, I found myself asking the question, what is a cowboy? Over the last few months, I've learned about cowboys of the cold, Mongolian eagle hunters, who were coincidentally right after the vote featured on a segment by 60 Minutes, the oldest and most watched news magazine on television. Lori Cotter Bryslin, Pascack Hills class of 87, and founder and executive director of Victory Hill Therapeutic Horsemanship, where they teach all abilities, genders, races, et cetera, life skills through horsemanship. And New York City's Federation of Black Cowboys, dedicated to keeping alive the memory and tradition of African-American cowboys from the Old West, where during the 1870s and 1880s, African-American cowboys made up approximately 25% of the 35,000 cowboys in the Western frontier. The Federation, according to their mission, honors this legacy through youth programs, rodeos, and school visits, while also using horsemanship to teach local youth life skills such as patience, kindness, and tolerance. Just a few examples of many of who and what cowboy, cowboys are and can be. Before a snap vote to remove, Maybe we should have asked our community the question, what is a cowboy and what does being a cowboy mean to you? For an example from the world of education, I offer the University of Wyoming, the world needs more cowboys marketing campaign. A cowboy isn't what you are, but who you are. Drawing upon Wyoming's proud heritage, this campaign redefines what it means to be a cowboy in this day and age, distilling it down to the inner spirit of curiosity and boldness that all who call themselves cowboys and cowgirls can identify with, no matter their race or gender, or whether they're students, employees, alumni, or other supporters, UW President Lori Nichols says. The cowboy spirit is what the University of Wyoming helps instill in its students, giving them the skills and support they need to make the breakthroughs that benefit our state and the world. 
I believe the Board of Education has failed our community by focusing only on what they think a cowboy and cowgirl is not, and not encouraging and allowing for conversation about what it is and can be. And it's never too late to have that conversation in a constructive way. As the committees move forward with their process, I welcome them to use the above as an example of how important it is to identify what we value and believe in selecting a mascot, in selecting a mascot which it sounds like they have been doing because that ultimately is what is in a name. Thank you. Any other comments under old business? Kristen? I just, I know that we sent out something new regarding email correspondence. And I think that this speaks to Mike with some of the people sending in messages and not getting replies. Mm -hmm. So I think that moving forward, maybe we can have a discussion, even if it's within the communication. I, I strongly believe anybody who sends an email that says Board of Ed, being that I'm part of the Board of Ed, I, I think we owe them a response and not the automated one. I mean, like a true response to their issues and their concerns. Because I feel like community feels unheard when they take the time to compose a letter or an email and then we don't respond. Yep. Sure. So um, there's 4,000 parents in our district. There's 2,000 students. So there's 6,000 possible options for feedback. I think that we have to, as a Board of Education, identify a response that's appropriate when, when people actually reach the Board of Education as a whole. Um, you know, Dr. Gunderson, you can share your sentiments, but as a Board of Education, our job is to receive information and to understand it, to process it and discuss it as we make decisions. Um, and over the, the, I guess, seven years I've been a board member, some of the emails are very emotional, some are political, some are downright nasty, some are um, factual and informational. They provide really good feedback for us as a board. So. Certainly I, I you know, would default to my colleagues, yep. but to specifically answer every single email with the intent to address concerns that many times are just downright aggressive or almost un, you know, it, it's just very difficult to make a commitment to respond to every single person um, independent of the content of the nature of the email. So I appreciate what you're saying and I, reached out to Dr. Gunderson that we at least put together a response where people do feel heard that the emails that they send to this Board of Education as a whole have been recognized and, and discussed appropriately. So th that's my personal perspective, but Dr. Gunderson, you know, share with us. One of the things we, we had talked about as well, because there's a four new members on this Board of Education, the, the opinions and the feeling of how we operate as a board last year might not be identical to what the intentions are of this board right now. So I think what we had also said was that the communications committee yeah. will also bring this topic up and talk about this in a little bit more detail to yeah. see if whether the everything from should the automated message read differently or should there be a particular practice that we adopt as a board when there are yep. those types of emails that come to the full board. And I know that Mr. Blundo is the chair of that committee. Yeah, I was happy to read that this weekend. I, I wanted to be on it. I didn't know I was going to be chair. But yes, I can assure you that we'll make that a topic. Um, and, you know, Tammy's comments uh, are, are, I get them, but I understand yours as well. Um, I also think on a, on a slightly different note, sometimes you do respond and we don't see your response. So we feel that, and we'll talk about it in the committee, we feel something might have been addressed very appropriately but we kind of feel like, hey, what's going on and has this issue been closed? So something else I'd like to talk about when we talk about responses. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to add something, uh, particularly when we had the mascot discussion last year. I got 500 emails a day, maybe more. It, it was Many of them were less than complimentary. <laughs> now, to say that I'm a type A person is kind of like saying Godzilla's Bambi. I'm like that by nature. But I have to keep that in check. We all do, because I represent the Board of Education. We all do. When somebody sends it to board. So 
there's a right way to handle particularly incendiary things and sometimes the best thing is to say nothing not because you're trying to avoid a contentious discussion because we have responsibilities here but a lot of people also look to stoke calls sometimes and if it's an administrative thing uh, eric's the chief school administrator and so there are certain things that i believe if appropriate that he or his team have to answer because some of it's minutiae that we're just not that deep in the weeds. Now, uh, speaking for myself, and I'd be happy to share any board member my email at any time, there are zero unread emails in my box. Zero. Every day. When I, at the end of my day, there are zero. So some I, I read two, three, three or more times. Some of them are heartbreaking, some of the things we see. Um, some of the things are frustrating. But I, I think the public should know, and I know some some of my other uh, teammates, uh, uh, some of us are new to each other, so we're getting to know each other. But um, we're reading these things. We are listening. And we discuss in the committee meetings and in the closed door meetings, we discuss particularly the incendiary or truly, and you know, not that anyone's concern is unimportant, but there are some real issues that real people are having out there. And we're, especially with the pandemic and everything, so I, I just want the public to know that we're not blowing them off. We take this very, very seriously uh, and that we really consider everything they have to say. But again, getting back to certain things, it's not appropriate that we as board members reply because, you know, we we can only share our concerns with Eric as the superintendent. And then he has to decide how to address certain things, because if a we're not supposed to do it and B it could give the public the wrong idea that we don't have the confidence in the administration. So I think that there's a very fine line between getting back to someone and undermining Eric's team's efforts as well. So uh, tell me if I said something wrong or anybody disagrees with. But. I, I think you're, I think that was very accurate. And here's the thing too, is that when one of us responds, we re respond on behalf of the entire board, right? We, we are very much a team. So when there's a response, it should be a collective response. And anyone, you know, we, we've um, addressed issues where some of us, uh, you know, four of us have said, I believe this thing. And, you know, a couple of us said, I don't believe that. And so what's really important is that when we address the public, A, we're setting a policy that it's an all or nothing. We can't just pick and choose who we want to, uh, you know, get back to and who we don't want to get back to. We need to say either we address it this way or we don't because we're a team. Um, you know, and the other thing is I will never make a response on behalf of this board without everyone on this board providing feedback when I do so. So I'm never going to say, well, on behalf of the school board, A, B, C, and D, if I haven't checked with each and every one of you. Now, um, what I'll usually do is I'll reach out for everyone individually because collectively violates a quorum, the quorum rules. But, you know, it's, it's, you make a really good point and it's, it's very compelling what, you know, it's, <laughs> What Mike was saying when the mascot thing came up, I really wanted to respond to a lot of people. Of course, I chose not to do that, um, but it was difficult. And so yeah, I'm glad that the communications committee is doing this. I'm really glad that Joe's leading the charge on this. He's got a great handle on this perspective. Um, so we'll all provide feedback and we'll figure out how to address that issue. It should be looked at. So I'd like to add just to my thoughts and perspective on this. You know, I think there's a reason why a communications committee has been established. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the mascot. And, you know, I think a failure in communication for me, who's Joe resident at the time is when the board sends out an email that's only um, signed by seven of the nine members. So a response, uh, an email is going to the board, but a response is only coming back from the seven of the nine. So what are the other two of the nine think? Um, to clarify the automated response, has that been changed? Yes, it has. Okay. It so I sent mean, the test it email. It, can't be, it doesn't mean it can't be changed again after some discussion with the communications committee and assuming that the outcome of the discussion in the communications committee also meets with the approval of the, of the president. So just two more thoughts along these lines. Um, I sent a test email to myself over the weekend. I didn't get an automated response because I wanted to see what the response was. So that wasn't received. So five, five times four days. And we were going to, we were discussing the amount of time that it takes for the response to actually come back. I think that it's four days, right? 
six four days? Um, the the note on there about you'll only get one of these messages every four days. It's a Google thing. We can't change Google. So if you send it to board, if you send an email to board members at pascac.org, the first message you send will have that response. If you send additional messages to that group within the scope of four days, you won't get that same automated response again. I didn't get that response at all. I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. I checked my junk. I checked everywhere. I never got it. Because we, I, yeah. I did see that you sent a test email, uh, but I wasn't aware that you didn't get the automated response. Yeah. And I think, I mean, since since our responsibility is policy and, and this does speak to policy, um, I I would prefer if we reverted back to the old message until communications has had the opportunity to discuss this, because I think that may or may not receive a response to your email. I don't know if that sends the right message to our community. Like if I send an email that maybe um, is not complimentary, but shows my upset and I don't get a response, I'm left to question, well, what are they responding to? Only to the kind, warm and fuzzies, or you know, not being responsive to to other questions or issues that I might be raising. So, um, again, my preference would be if we bounce that back to the communications committee and let them tease it out and come back with recommendations. Unfortunately, we have a meeting coming on, on Thursday, I think, yeah, right? Which, of course, I'm going to probably I might be on partially, but yes. Um, let's uh, let's let, can we revert back until until that meeting happens? That's up to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think it's, yeah, a fair request. Okay. We'll revert back to the to the original message. And, and I think the second piece is, and I know different boards of education have different protocols and approaches. You know, Montvale K-8, they offer the email address for all of their board members. Um, when, when you look to others, they don't. Uh, we do not. Um, you know, we did receive a handful of emails last week um, when there was a correspondence sent out. Um, I know that I received um, text messages, emails, I got a phone call. You know, if, if I'm performing board business, my preference would be that I, I'm encouraging people to email me through my board email address um, because I'm being put in a position anywhere where I have to respond. Um, so if they're not emailing me at I don't even want to say it because then I might open the door, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if they're not emailing me at my PASCAC address, um, which is mweaver at pascac.org, um, then they're calling me. And so I have to respond regardless. Um, you know, depending on what issues come up, I'd rather get people in the habit of, of contacting me, quote unquote, officially, um, rather than, you know, by personal means. Though we know they're going to do that anyway, right? Oh yeah. So, so the board had a conversation about this probably about two years ago, mm -hmm. if I, if my memory serves me correct, um, and we made a conscious decision not to put individual email addresses on there because then the assumption sometimes would be made by a member of the public that that board member was going to respond to me, and therefore it could be perceived that that res response was on behalf of the Board of Education. So we're bringing in a representative from New Jersey School Boards to talk with uh, the four new board members. We are going to record that meeting with Mr. Lee um, so that all board members can take a look at it. Um, and one of the questions that we are going to be addressing with him is the pros and cons of publicizing individual board member email addresses out there because it's a slippery slope. It can put individual board members in difficult positions, again, because of that perception that you're doing board business and individual board members should not be doing board business. The board as a whole does board business. The board president can take care of, uh, can take care of board business and respond back and forth with emails. So let's examine that a little bit uh, more closely. And again, we can revisit that yeah. as a board. Eric, I may ask um, Paul to move that meeting. I didn't realize this was going to be, and I did say yes, so it's not his fault, forgetting that I was supposed to be on an airplane. So um, I'm going to see if he can move it, but it, uh, hopefully it won't be too far out, but I'll keep okay. you posted. I'll connect with Paul tomorrow and I'll, okay. we'll talk Thank about you. that. That would be good. And I think the thing that's important to note too is that, you know, we have four new board members which means that we have an, an opportunity to take a new perspective at the way we do business as a team, right? I've, I've always been very um, 
philosophically focused on teams, primarily because I think we do better work together when we are a team. And secondarily, because I'd like to protect the integrity of each individual that's on this team, because once you have dialogue with a member of the community, then you know the member of commu the community then comes back and says, well, I had a very long conversation and it gets into a he says, she says thing. So when there's ever an issue with the community, they always have the opportunity to jump on one of our, our board meetings and to be able to have dialogue so that we're all on equal footing as we we move forward within our community, right? It protects the integrity of each of us as individuals. It protects the integrity of our board and the integrity of our school district. So, um, but clearly it's an opportunity for us to relook at it and under Joe's leadership, um, let's just kind of pick it apart, vet it out and see what we can do. Any other comments? Yeah, before we move on, I just had one more question about the formalization of the committees. Mm -hmm. um, I know I had reached out to you about this and yeah. I, I kind of looked back and I guess last year there were seven committees. This year we added the equity and the, the communications. Mm -hmm. But it seems in the past that each board member was asked to serve on two or three committees. Right. Um, this year we were asked to say three we were interested in, but then got assigned a fourth. And I feel like with nine committees and nine board members, if we each serve on three, it would allow a little bit more flexibility and just be a little bit less, especially for as a new board member to manage if we mm -hmm. each just did three and would give you as a president an opportunity to kind of bounce back and forth. Because once we hit the four, there's really no flexibility in other people joining in on meetings. Yeah, so so generally <laughs> what, what Eric and I, uh, I did this year is we took everyone's first choices and we tried to be able to honor and get everyone, especially the new board members, into all the committees that they wanted to be able to participate in. Um, we made a conscious decision to have individuals who had experience with each of those committees chair those committees. Um, Jim, just simply for the fact that they take the minutes of the meetings, have institutional knowledge because they've been on them before, and they report out at the board meeting. Um, so it's really up to you as members of the board to decide how you want to configure the committees. I'm open to however you want to do it. Um, if there's ever someone who is not going to attend a meeting, I will jump into that spot, and I agree with you. Um, I like to attend uh, each one of the committees at least once a year, right, just to get the feel for what is going on. Um, it, it, you know, so if there's a board member that's unhappy with a committee or you want to jump off a committee, it doesn't matter, matter to me <laughs> at all. Um, if you think that only three people should be on each committee. I'm good with that too. We just tried to be able to provide as many opportunities, particularly for the new board members to jump on as many committees as we could for the sake of experience. But it's, it's, it's except as one or the other to me. Do you want to be on three committees? Do you want to be on four committees? Can we discuss it? How, I, <laughs> Can I email me? It's <laughs> what is just being new, what is the typical amount of time that each committee meets per it's year? Oh. Well, the meetings are an hour and then it depends like, um, you know, something like communications, maybe three times a year. Um, and uh, something like policy might be higher in both categories because if something's presented to us, well, I'm not on it anymore, thankfully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's also, it's very, um, it's very administrative. We get tons of stuff from the state that we have to review, which is real tedious. But um, so it depends. But a typical committee, I'd say three times a year, an hour each. Eric, do you agree? Yeah, I, I would agree. That, that's that's about average. There are some of the committees, post-secondary planning, health, wellness and safety. Those meet twice a year. The others three, maybe four times a year. And the meetings are held to an hour. Except for negotiations. Yeah, that's going to be longer. <laughs> yeah. Except for negotiations. Negotiations, especially if it's a teacher's year, could be more than that. Well, I'm glad. Yeah, that's a very good point. Negotiations is the exception to the rule. Yeah, there's four people who cannot be on the negotiations committee because of a conflict on yeah. the board. So should I be on 
policy and negotiations. I, that's just a, just a general question, just because I do want to make sure that I am dedicating my full attention to something that I commit to. So I just, I'm thinking about this now and I, like, <laughs> no offense, the comment from policy and then the comment from negotiation. I'm like, oh my God, wait a second, I'm on those two. And the other ones, I mean, I'm very passionate, obviously about the health and wellness yeah. and communication. So um, I would like to visit that then if that's gonna be the case. So if I can just offer a suggestion, um, if there are any board members that have concerns about the committee that they've been um, assigned to, which again, as Ms. Molinelli said, was based on your requests. If you're concerned about the, the number of committees that you're on and you would like to drop off of one, why don't you email or, or call Ms. Molinelli? Um, we can certainly go ahead and modify this list right now. Um, and then you can have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation about what's involved with those committees as well. And by the way, you can call me also if you want a little bit more perspective of what that individual committee does. Ms. Molinelli has not been on all the committees, so maybe you can't speak from a specific experience on each of the committees, um, but feel free to give me a call or, or drop me an email, and I'm sure the same thing for Ms. Molinelli. I do have to say that although negotiations does take a lot of time, um, Typically, it's the large uh, collective bargaining unit um, with the teachers that takes the most time. The other collective bargaining units really doesn't, they really don't take all that much time. And those negotiations all take place once every three years. So um, it's not intense all the time. It's just intense for a particular period of time. Can I make sure I addressed exactly what you were asking? It, 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 as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking you might have been asking two things. Are you asking if everyone wants to just be on three committees or are you asking that everyone provide feedback if there's a committee that they didn't want to be on? No, like I'm thinking if there was, if everybody did three, then we would be able to then kind of go to other committees and also be involved. So if I wasn't on, I'm, I, I can't be in negotiations, but if I wasn't on finance and I was interested, yeah. I could sign up once and go. Like it gives us all a little more flexibility then to kind of see what's going on in all of the groups. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Can I get thoughts from the other? I don't disagree with what Kristen's saying. Um, I know it's a tough job for you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Please. If you need if you need me on four, I'll go on four. But I get what she's saying. So why don't we sit down and so okay, let's do this. I have an idea. Y'all know the committees that we originally put you on. If you would like to be on three committees and you really just love three committees, could you just let us know? And then um, it'll it would give colleagues the opportunity to jump into other committees if you like. You know, if, if I can add something too about the sure. time factor, I of the legacy board members, I'm the newest. This is my third year term, whatever, and I knew nothing. I, I did not come from this world, and I'm not shy, so I just asked. You know, like I, I'm on the finance committee, and when I started, okay, I got a master's in finance. So what? School finance is so different than anything else that I would just. Uh, call up our business manager and say, please help me out with this. Uh, you know, like Dr. Bundy said, I signed up for this. I'm serious about it. My full attention. I'm committed. What do I do? And uh, she and now he, when the, the, the change of the guard, they help. And the other board members, I called and I asked. I said, how should I be looking at this? Not for spin, but just so uh, what should I be looking for? And I asked for a lot of help. Please, please ask. Because I'll your time's I'll valuable. We don't want you spinning your I, wheels. I think it also depends on what the committees are. Like if Kelly's on policy and negotiations, maybe she shouldn't be on four. I mean, I'm fine with being on the four that I'm on. So I, I don't have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. But I also don't know anything. So this is just yeah, So, so but you know, you bring up a good point. What we look for in the committees is leadership because within our administration, the people who actually provide the information to be able to look at are have the institutional knowledge. So um, when we talk about finance, Dots and, and Eric are there, and they're going to talk in the context of this is what's important that you need to know as a board member. Um, it, it's it's I don't want to say it's an executive summary because you can ask any question on anything you want at any time. But it's not as though you need to walk into a finance meeting be a, being a financial planner, right? Um, and it, it, I guess maybe it's a little hard to explain if you haven't like sat through some of the meetings because you don't. Um, nobody knows. As Mike said, you don't know what you don't know. Um, 
And when someone is unable to attend a meeting, we can let you know as well if you wanted to slip into that spot. But I'll, I'll take a look at, at the committees uh, again and see if we can do, if we can break it down to just three people. Um, we tried to be as equitable as we can. We spent well over an hour just trying to make sure everyone was happy. <laughs> so, I, you know, we did the best we could at round one. Um, but if what I'm hearing is if everyone wants to just be on three committees to have flexibility to go to other ones, we can reconfigure it. It's not a problem. I, I also want to second what Mike said. And I know one of us didn't connect this weekend and tried, and I did connect with another one. But if you have questions, you know, this is unprecedented, really, for new members. And, um, you know, call, text, email, would be happy to, to, you know, I can't believe I'm like third now from the presidency, you know, uh, seven years in. And um, uh, please call informal conversations and uh, let you know how Absolutely. I learned it. Too. I, I mean, to Joe's point, when, when I came on, I was the only new member. So there were a lot more people to help bring me along. But that's OK. So just whatever it is you need, please, please ask. I was spoiled, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we are really lucky because as colleagues, there's nine of us. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that sit on other boards in other areas. <laughs> it's it's not, not always quite as um, cordial. So I really, yeah, just pick up the phone and call anyone and, and we'll go from there. But I'll, I'll take a look at the committee list. If there is a committee that you just have a preference to not be on, if you could let me know, that would be great as we kind of relook at this again. So we'll chat about that the next couple of days. All right, appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, oh, uh, any, more, any more old business? Okay, uh, moving on to new business, Dr. Gunderson. Um, can you talk about the principal search timeline? Yes, absolutely. So it is about that time of year that we are going to launch our principal search for Pascack Valley High School. This year will be a little bit different. As you recall, last year we were searching for two principals and we had a joint effort between the two buildings. It was a district-wide initiative to, uh, to find two principals. This year we are looking for one principal for Pascack Valley. And uh, the board has been has received a rather comprehensive overview of what that process is going to look like. So for the public's knowledge, we are going to be advertising this weekend um, in on NJ.com, which is how we're going to get the word out. We are also going to be spreading the word via social media to various networks, professional organizations in the county and the state and regionally. There's going to be a February 12th deadline for submissions for the position. Come March 1st, we will have first round interviews. That first round committee will consist of some staff members, parents, students, a couple of Board of Education members as well. March 15th, we will have second round interviews with a more narrow selection of candidates based on the feedback from the first round interviewing committee. That committee will be primarily comprised of administrators and supervisors and also a board member. By April 5th, we expect to have the final two candidates in place. Um, and I will be able to then uh, recommend a candidate to the Board of Education. And by the middle of April, we hope to have Board of Education approval for a new principal, which will give that candidate, if it's an outside candidate, enough time to give notice in their current district. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to go ahead and begin the transition process. Very good. Uh, so at the risk of being controversial, uh, Ms. Adams brought up at the beginning of public comment her thoughts on the fiscal piece of the mascot change. Yeah. Right. Um, I want to take just a minute to share a personal thought. Um, we heard hundreds of students from the district talk about the pain that they personally felt uh, with the attachment of the mascot. They shared stories of the pain that their colleagues felt in regards to the mascot and what that represented to them, not just during their high school experience, but also post high school experience. Just speaking for myself, I felt as though um, as a board member, I had obligation to the students who really were struggling with the mascot that they were associated with, um, that they 
felt very difficult. It, it hurt them greatly. There was tears. You could see the pain on their face. So in going into my decision for that particular meeting, I will share with all of you, I believe I've shared with the public, I made my vote and my decision based on the pain that the students were feeling. I, I didn't, it didn't cross my mind to ask members of the community how they felt because children were in front of me crying because of this particular issue. So as board members, I think we should stand up and share our perspectives on the mascot issue. Um, and I think the fiscal piece of it is important. It's our job to do that. I also think with social change, and for me, when I see large groups of, of young people who are participating within a school that um, it, I'm tasked to be able to have decision-making and influence over, that was the reason that I chose to retire the mascots and to be able to just ask the students what else was possible for them, what represented them, what did they feel good with, what empowered them. So I do think it's time for us to talk about the fiscal piece and Dr. Gunderson, I'd like to encourage you to sure. identify those areas where fiscally there might be a change, um, but teeing it up by saying, from my perspective, I think it's time that we make uh, that particular shift and that while the fiscal piece is something we of course have to be responsible for, we also have to be responsible for the well-being of our students. To me, that uh, matters above all else when I make decisions um, on behalf of the board, it's for the kids. And so um, in the spirit of trying to balance the well-being and the fiscal piece of it, I, I just felt like I needed to share that. But we are in a place where the fiscal piece is important. Uh, and so- Before we get the fiscal, I, I just, I think that there has to be other comments. Now, I respect um, your position and very hard to dispute it, especially with Indians. And if I could go back in time, I would not have voted. And I've said this before to get rid of the Indian. My personal perspective is um, I viewed it as strength. And I, but I understand what you're saying. I respect okay? that. I understand what you're saying. And I did vote to turn it over. I can't I can't escape that. But I. I wish I could go back in time. It wouldn't have mattered. It would have been eight one instead of nine nothing. Maybe it would have been seven two. Um, but I wonder if, before we talk about the money, if you had, I hate to direct this to you, Tammy, but for anybody that um, agrees with ta what Tammy had to say in justifying, not justifying, but in making your decision, do you feel the same way about the cowboy? Um, I, I have to tell you that one blew me away. Um, I, I, even though I wish we could have stayed Indians, I can understand a lot more of the, um, arguments, positions, Cowboys blew me away and still to this day do. Um, and I just, and, and I, full disclosure, went to this school and always will be a Pasco Valley Indian. As corny as that might sound, it's truth. Okay. <laughs> Um, but I don't know if we do this, if we don't do this, but I am curious if anyone else feels, we heard Mike early, Michael, I don't know if you like Mike, but Michael, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I, I honestly could see keeping cowboy, but I'm wondering, maybe this is the time to have this conversation if others agree. And I would not bring up Indian at this point, but I am curious if more than Michael and I agree that Cowboys could be kept because we do have the ability as a board to change that decision. Well, I I'd think like we to have a comment. I, yeah, yeah. I, in, in response to what Joe was asking about the Cowboy, um, I know in the past there have been many young women uh, who have been in athletic teams at Hills who didn't feel that they were a boy. And I think that uh, if we could find a mascot that doesn't have a gender attached to it, would be a much better idea than keeping cowboys. I, uh, I'd like to say something. Um, that night, I, I'll, 
I think we rushed to judgment on the cowboy. I, I fully appreciate Janet's statement about the gender. I, I agree uh, with that. Um, I'm an Indian. My wife's an Indian. My kids are Indians. But to me, it was important to show that while I disagreed, I voted for it because I, it was a very important social issue. I'm sure, Joe, you, you, you vote first, but alphabetically. I mean, couldn't your name be one or two letters better? No, no, listen, straight up. You know, you voted first. It would have been seven, two, but it didn't make sense. It was more important to show unity on a very important social issue. My, uh, my two issues were, I thought the cowboy was completely blindsided. I'll just say it to be crystal clear. No question in my mind and how that was brought up. I'm friends with that person over 40 years, but we all have our right to our opinions on this board. And we can say what we want. Um, uh, I think that that was a little hasty. Um, I'd be willing to discuss it and consider it, but I think that should be communicated to the students. If that's something that a majority of us feel we would consider while well, the, the Hill students are going through their exercise now, that should be communicated to them sooner rather than later, if that's something that we would consider. To be fair to them, and they may totally reject it. And that's fine. It's, we decided that we're gonna leave it up to the students to come up with the answers. Um, so, but I, I, was, I think it was important that we voted to support unanimously a decision. Um, you know, we have to live with it. We, we made our calls. We, we stand by it. We're adults. But um, I, think it was, I think it was a little hasty that night, too, but it's in the past. Hopefully, we'll learn from it as a board. There's no finger pointing here. We just be stronger and better. That's all I have to say about that. Well, I'm thinking now if it's in the kids' hands, if that's something we as a board are okay with, then that could be one of their options. They can be the cowboys and cowgirls if that's what they choose. And if their committee goes a different direction, then that's their choice. Since they already have the ball rolling, I think that we need to leave it to the students and the administration that's working with them. Can I uh, say a few things here? Um, Absolutely. First of all, I, um, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, each generation identifies itself. And when we were there that night hearing what the students were presenting and um, knowing that uh, the students, well, some in, in their clubs were actually visiting reservations. So they were seeing firsthand uh, the plight of the Native Americans even to this day. And it was very difficult to them to reconcile, uh, you know, having a mascot as the Indian and seeing the reality of how the Native Americans are today. And uh, I think that really struck a chord with us. And I too was moved by the idea of switching the mascot out. Now, there were two things that came up about the cowboy which kind of uh, sold me on the idea of switching that at the same time. One was the uh, gender uh, issue, cowboy, cowgirl. Um, and that did come up. That came up in letters that we received. Um, and the other one was um, the fact that you had an association with Indians and cowboys traditionally when the mascots were formed. And so uh, my feeling was, okay, look, if the students are gonna uh, pick a mascot, then maybe both schools should do this at the same time so that uh, you know they get an idea and they can choose what they want for their generation and, and what they're feeling. Because evidently, I didn't feel that way about Indians and I didn't feel that way about cowboys. And I had no idea as to how deep these issues uh, were with the students, okay? I, I really, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a band parent. I was wearing the, uh, the Indian shirt, the sweatshirt and everything else. 
Uh, I went to Hills one year, so I am a cowboy. Uh, but then again, it's this generation that has to choose. And I, I see nothing wrong with this. I think the time has come. I, I have a comment. Um, you know, if we're talking about that cowboys uh, doesn't need to be changed, the gender part to me is, is important as a female. And I, I don't know, Janet mentioned that there were girls who didn't feel inclusive, included. Um, at that point, I feel like, well, how many boys would like to be called cowgirls? Like, what if the name was changed to cowgirls? Would the boys be like, yeah, we're going to be cowgirls now? So to me, I just sort of feel like the gender part is an issue. And unless we're going to say the girls' uniforms say cowgirls and the boys say cowboys, I don't really think it's a valid name. I think was done in the past, right? The, the female sports were cowgirls, or so am I wrong? It's, it's interesting that you bring that up, too. And I don't mean to say that we need to shift over to the fiscal aspect of this right now. But I found it really interesting when I received the, um, the report from the athletic director of Pascack Hills High School that the uniforms that need to be cycled out for a change due to the mascot change are all boys' uniforms. The girls' teams did not have any reference to the mascot on any of their uniforms. Good point. Okay. Wow. And as mentioned before by Mr. Stankus, it was the school climate survey that indicated a significant issue of Pascack Hills is gender inequity. Whether that's actual or perceived, the perception of girls at Pascack Hills High School is that they are not valued as much as boys. And when you see the uniforms that need to be changed, boys basketball, boys lacrosse, wrestling, boys soccer, and baseball. Those are the only uniforms that need to be changed because the girls never had them on their, not never, recently at least, currently don't have them on their uniforms. Is Callahan the appropriate gender neutral term? Just ask you. I think this is great dialogue, and I think that it's important dialogue that we have before we talk about fiscal and we move into hearing what the committees are going to share with us in regards to there. There's no there's no one that said there's no rule that says that this could be considered by the committee currently. I, I don't know what they're you know, considering. They, they're tasked to be able to come up with three different ideas of what they want to be called. So. Maybe this is one of them. I, I have no idea. Um, I just know that when you look at the climate survey, there is an equity in our district. Um, so moving on. To the so I, I would be hard pressed to assume that the student committee at Hills thinks that cowboys, cowgirls is on the table. Could you say that again? I would be hard pressed to assume mm -hmm. that the committee at Hills thinks that cowboys, cowgirls is an option to them. I would agree with that. The Board of Education voted to retire the mascots. Well, I'm just, Ms. Molinelli I, made I a statement that they, they could choose to go in that direction. But that's what I'm, I'm thinking I'm hearing you said, but... I would disagree that I don't think that the students think that that's an option to them. What I'm saying is I have no idea what they're choosing and what they're discussing. I, I got to say this. Um, you might be right. You are right. The school board retired it. But we definitely, and we can go back and listen to meetings. We definitely said at meetings that if Cowboys and Indians, and I get Indians is a really tough sell. I'm not going to, I'm not pushing for that. Um, was in play if that's what people wanted, it could, it would be considered. So this is where I, I have to say I have a problem sometimes because sometimes we say one thing, and three months later we go in a different direction, um, and that's a source of frustration for me. Now. I have no idea if they're even interested in in cowboys, cowgirls, and frankly. 
Tammy, you're right. This is great dialogue. And this is dialogue that should have happened in June. And then a month later, we had votes. But we didn't do it that way then for all the reasons we said. If we had had this kind of conversation back then, I think a lot more people would have been at peace with this. Um, but, Eric, I know I heard it. That, we, that, that it was said at some point that if either one of the schools wanted to retain, they would, that would be an option. I'm not disagreeing with you. But what Mr. Weaver is saying is he does not believe that the students of Pascack Hills believe that the cowboys or cowgirls is an option. And I'm agreeing with him. I don't think the students there believe that that is an option that they are able to entertain. And if this board wants me to make it very clear to both committees, that cowboys and Indians can be on the table, well then let's go ahead and give that directive to me so that I can tell the students what their options are. Let's be fair to our students and tell them what's in the parameters. Because right now, I would venture to guess that they are assuming right. that the Board of Education decided to retire the mascots, which the board did. You are correct. It was mentioned at a board meeting that all options should be on the table. The students themselves, they said today, that they have certain criteria that they are going to uphold in their selection process. And I didn't write them all down, but there's toughness, courage, grit. I heard not representing a group of people, being positive and inclusivity, pride, strength, and toughness. That's their criteria. If this board wants to make it specific and tell the student committees that Indians and cowboys or cowgirls are on the table, then let's go ahead and do that. And I can tell you right now, both student publications are tweeting out that this is a controversial topic right now. So those student groups know that this is something that the board is considering. But, but Eric, Eric, if the students already made the parameters that it's not going to be representative of a group of people, aren't they moving away from it already? I would argue that cowboys and cowgirls is not inclusive, so yes. But what's being discussed at this meeting here is, and I don't mean to put words in anyone's mouth, so correct me if I'm wrong, is that cowboys and cowgirls may not be considered to be offensive or exclusive. I find uh, it exclusive. You find it what? I find it exclusive. I mean, if you're, if the, if you're going to have one name for one, for boys, cowboys, and, and cowgirls for girls, maybe that's okay. But if you're only going to choose cowboys, that's definitely, definitely excluding the girls. And I think you need to go without a gender. Je Janet, I would agree with you a thousand yeah, percent. Yeah. If that was the, um, the decision, okay, I would absolutely believe in cowgirls and, and cowboys. Um, you know, you, you look at Rutgers, our state university, it's the Lady Knights, it's the Scarlet Knights, but they're often referred to as the Lady Knights. There's other schools and institutions that do the same thing. So I totally agree with you, Janet. It, if Cowboys was back on the table, it would have to be Cowboys, Cowgirls, um, depending on the, the gender of the, the team. Um, look, I'm not, I don't, I didn't want to bring this up and throw it back out there. I, I did, I did know that we, we did talk about if they wanted that, um, they should know that they can. Um, I think we should let them know that um, if that if that's a choice that they put in there, great, and then let it be voted on. Um, you did you were correct, Eric, um, and I believe, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. It was the Pascack Valley update that said they didn't want it to be named after a people. Right. Um, I don't know if I heard the same thing from the Hills representatives. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I separate the two. If in fact the criteria is that we've tasked them to pick one mascot, if in fact the criteria is, is that it has to be gender neutral, then Cowboys and Indians doesn't apply to the formula that the students are looking at in order to identify a prospective mascot to present to the Board of Education. Who gave them direction that it had to be gender neutral? They, they chose their own direction. If, if they did, and if Hill said, then, then that, that ends it. That's it, if that's what they want to do. That's, I but heard I, I, you say know. that as well. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's confusing to the kids if we're talking about we're trying to be uh, inclusive, not marginalize a group. Mm -hmm. And then you have a survey, like Eric said, where, where 
girls feel that they are not as valued, I think we're pedaling backwards here on an issue that really we shouldn't be discussing when it comes to kids. Like, we're just going to confuse the issue for them and say, hey, guess what? You really are marginalized. And I don't I don't agree with that. I, I just don't think that's the right message to send to the kids at this point. They've already defined their criteria. Cowboys and Indians don't fit in the criteria with which they themselves and they're a group of almost 70 people representing almost every person in the student body based on representation. They've already chosen what they what their criteria is and Cowboys and Indians don't fit in that. So um, I'd like to suggest to move forward with the fiscal piece of it. So unless there's strong. I just I just want to say one thing. It's it's just being new to the board and and not fully being, you know, d d learning about a lot of this and, and knowing that there was a lot of passion that goes into it. This is what I would just like to say to everybody just coming into this. It's 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 unfortunately a lot easier to find negativity in something than finding positivity in something. And, you know, I think that going forward when discussing these issues, because it's a beautiful thing that we have all this diversity is to try to focus on ways that things could be more positive instead of finding all the reasons why it has to be negative and it can't be something. Um, I did happen to really like what Mike said in what, you know, I learned some stuff tonight. Thank you. Um, on what is in a cowboy. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm in my mind right now. I'm not thinking about, and maybe I should, I'm just, I'm not thinking about the negativity or what it could be. I'm trying to think about all the positive things that, that I can, have that reflect and, and, and be a part of my life and represent. So I would just encourage anybody that's listening or any of the student body, I think you guys are tasked, all the students are tasked with, with something very difficult. Um, and I think that we need to try to look for the good and stuff instead of always trying to find the negativity in something. Those are good comments. Anyone else? So I, as, as we transition to the conversation on finance, mm -hmm. you know, I think we do, have done a very good job of confusing our children uh, on this topic. And I would also say embarrassing them. Now, I fully understand and appreciate the feelings that many of our students have around the topic of mascot. But now as we transition to costs, it's kind of like, well, this is a really important topic, but because it costs so much, we're going to have to pick and choose and phase in over time. So there's it, it kind of there's a contradictory element there for me. You know, I had a conversation with one of our Pascal Hills football players after the first game and they were playing an away game. And he goes, you know what is really stupid. I go, why was it really stupid? He goes in the first half, they were announcing tackled by a, a, a herd of cowboys. And in the second half, tackled by a group of Pascal Kills football players. I mean, that's what we've created publicly, you know, now for all of our students. And when I look in here, these are all very um, visible uh, elements of our district. And, you know, I'm curious to hear how the financial aspect of this will be tackled and how much of a priority it will be given um, considering how, I guess, offensive these images are to a number of our students. Thank you very much. All right. So Pascac Hills, the board received um, a report from me indicating what the estimated costs are to replace a variety of different uh, signage throughout the buildings at Pascac Hills, um, whether it's signs, carpet runners, uh, banners, murals on walls, scoreboard signs, amounts to approximately $31,000 at Pascac Hills. I should note, that there was a lot of talk on social media by some elected officials that um, the end zone at Pascac Hills High School would cost into six figures. That individual mayor wasn't too far off. The end zone, taking out the word cowboys in the end zone of Pascac Hills is an expensive item. 
that it's not something that I am proposing that we do right now. That's something that I believe that we do at a later date when the field turf is in a condition that warrants a replacement. That estimated cost to replace just the end zone is $75,000. So I want to make it clear, the $31,000 to replace signage of Pascac Hills right now is something that we can take care of in this year's budget with some unexpended costs, as well as we have in motion for the Finance Committee's approval to incorporate those changes next year as well. I would like to go ahead and talk, I mentioned the uniforms a little earlier. Um, the uniforms at Pascac Hills High School will amount to approximately $53,000 to replace those. Those as well, we would like to do as soon as possible, whether that's from funds that we have not expended this year due to some rather significant athletic savings because students have not been participating in county tournaments, state tournaments, and so on and so forth. There have been transportation and admission um, um, fee reductions that we have not had to expend. So some of those funds will be able to be taken care of this year, as well as budgeting into next year as well. We do wanna make sure that students recognize who their new mascot is and they can wear it with pride. And so at least varsity athletes won't be wearing um, uniforms with the old mascot. Can I, ask a question? can I ask a question about that though? Sure. So you're saying how the boys uniforms need to be redone because they have, let's say cowboys on them. So you're gonna replace all of the boys with new uniforms, but the females will get no new uniforms to have their new mascot this year? So that's a very good point. There are some uh, girls' uniforms that will be replaced as part of their ongoing, with, depending upon the sport, three to five year cycle of replacements. So there are some girl uniforms that are going to be um, purchased for this upcoming school year. It's just not specific to uniforms out of the that three to five year cycle that need to be replaced. Does that make sense? Uh, it does make fiscal sense, but I think if we're talking about equity at this point, that's an issue again now. We're only providing the boys and some female athletes with new uniforms that will have the new mascot and the girls will have to wait for the next five years before they're all rolled in. That's, you bring up a very good point and that's something that I can discuss with the athletic directors. For Pascac Valley High School, we're looking at items such as um, baseball scoreboards where there's a, the, the word Indian, um, the turf field scoreboard as well, some signage in the gymnasium, um, rubber mats and runners in the, um, all, uh, throughout the, the school, tablecloths and a graduation stage banner. That amounts to twenty thousand. Uh, I'm sorry, twenty nine thousand dollars. Should be noted that I think Pascac Valley, to some of the points that were brought up before, Pascac Valley has anticipated this change coming at some point that we would be phasing out the Indian, um, and I would argue that that's why the cost at Pascac Valley is not as great. That being said, there are some wrestling mats that are not scheduled to be replaced soon. Uh, the estimated cost for that is about fifteen thousand dollars. Similar argument to the end zone up at Pascac Hills. With regards to the uniforms, a wide variety of different uniforms would need to be replaced that have the word Indian on it, and that amounts to $36,000 at Pascac Valley High School. And that's the overall financial impact. Again, we'll talk in a little bit more detail with the Finance Committee about plan of action, how quickly we move to change signage as well as uniforms, and certainly the, uh, the point that you brought up, Ms. Martin, about the gender equity piece there. I'll revisit that with the athletic directors as well. So, so Eric, I did some quick math, and, and this isn't going to be decided, in my opinion, on, on these dollars, but I want to make sure my quick math on the things that needed to be changed were about 130000 um, from both schools, excluding the end zone and the wrestling max, right? Okay, just want to make sure that I, I kind of capture that. Another thing while we're talking about this, and this has come up many, many times from many, many people, and yes, alum. I, I'd like, if you agree with this, I'd like you to state on the record that no trophies, uh, media, the, the trophies that say Indians and Cowboys and all the history is not going to one day not be in the hall. Because I, if I've heard it once, I've heard it. 25 times that people are worried about that. 
I, I think you actually called me up one day and said that you were hearing rumors that we were loading up dumpsters of I, I did old get that, cool. that had the Indian head logo on it. Never. That couldn't be further from the truth. If there was ever a comment about erasing history, that would be a textbook example of doing so. We have no intention of Thank doing you. that. Trophies throughout the school will continue to be uh, there. Pictures of students in their Indian uniform, you know, in their uniforms that say Indians or at Hills with Cowboys will be there. We're talking about branding for the school will change as a result of new yeah. mascots. I, That's what we're talking about. I believe that then. I just wanted you to say it crystal clear tonight so that there's no more question about it. Thank I you. I appreciate that. Eric, for the, for the, you said the 70, the end zone and the wrestling mats, when do you anticipate that that would be changed? So I think that the overall, the typical lifespan of the turf field, and Yas, I don't mean to put you on the spot right now, but I think it's something like six years or so, depending upon well, the- Well, turf fields are um, usually about 10 years. It depends 10. on how well you maintain it as well. And I believe we maintain it very well. So uh, it's a matter of use, but generally it's about 10 years. That's when you replace the turf. Great, thank you. And wrestling mats? I'm not quite sure what the lifespan is I, on that. I'm not really sure about wrestling mats. I no. think it's well, once it starts getting a little, right. you know, yeah, they'll so start we're, curling right. and things like that. And, and those, by the way, you know, if it's really important to this board or if it's really important to uh, a fundraising body that they want to go ahead and take this on, that's something that the board can entertain. But from an overall branding standpoint, I think the most impact that we're going to have is going to be on basic signage. Um, throughout the buildings and on our scoreboards and so on and so forth. And, and really, a $75,000 cost of swapping out an end zone, I see that as money that can be better spent elsewhere in the interim. No, I agree. I'm just, I'm just trying to think about this, that if we're going to have, te if we're going to change um, the, the mascot, but then it's still going to say cowboy. And, I, what, and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with the mascot change. I'm just saying if, if they're going to change it, that's going to look kind of funny to, you know, maybe we're the, the bumblebees. And then again, I'm just throwing this out there. And then there's big cowboys for the next 10 years. Or um, I don't know if, if it's on the, if Indians are on the, in, the end zone here or not. No. Okay. Or wrestling mats. It's just, it, it, I feel like it's going to kind of defeat the purpose of, of it all. And I'm not saying to do it, not to it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't uh, rethink, you know, cowboys, um, for that cost purpose. But I, I do think that these all need to kind of be taken into consideration that we're, we're so passionate about a change and, but this change could take 10 years or kind of be done or kind of not be done. So I think it's important for the, for the students in the community to understand that. I, I agree. I, we took out those two high cost items because we felt that that warranted more discussion and more thought as we move forward. But um, if we looked at higher priority items, I think that's really, you know, what we're looking at right now. But you have a very good point. And how old is the turf at Hills? Two years. Two years, maybe? So we'd be oh, the, turf at, at, the turf at Pascac Hills is relatively new. That's right. So we'd be looking at eight years. Okay. And that's a field where football, boys soccer, girls soccer, Track and field. Track and field. Lacrosse. Boys lacrosse. Graduation. Girls lacrosse. Graduation. It's a pretty significant visual. And and I, I have to assume that um, the, uh, Robert looked at, I, I hate to say this because I want it to be still Cowboys, but looked at changing the color, painting it, just taking out. I don't know if he's done all that. Yeah, you know, that's that was my suggestion. Like, isn't there something we can do to go ahead and-, and Cover it up. I, I hate uh, that. No, but yeah. I, what, what I thought would be a relatively simplistic solution to this, apparently uh, doesn't work well. That. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Not that there aren't other solutions potentially out there, um, but nothing that we've discovered yet. So I just want to note on the Pascac Hills, the first line, the cowboy country sign, remove, it has an estimated cost of NA. Uh, it's important to note that that was approximately, I believe, a $5,000 donation from one of the graduating classes. So we'd be just taking it. If it needs to be taken, it needs to be taken, but then discarding something of significant value that was made via donation, which 
doesn't sit well with me either. But, you know, I'm going to go on the other end of the spectrum and say that if this is what we're going forward with, then cost shouldn't be an issue. We've got to figure out a way to put it in the budget and put our kids in the uniforms that don't reflect those mascots and have signage that doesn't reflect that. And if the, if a new mascot is selecting a new mascot and branding it, and I don't see a cost for maybe consulting with any outside agencies. And I know that there was some conversation with one. Um, I mean, my expectation is that we would be ready to go in September of 2021 for fall sports and fall clubs and everything else. And just a quick question about the signage. Is that cost what it's going to cost to take it down or take it down and replace it with the new branding? Take it down and replace with the new branding. And again, I need to ask them, I need to emphasize that these are estimated costs. Any of our colleagues um, joining us virtually, any thoughts or comments? Nope. Okay. Um, any other conversation? Any other thoughts? Okay. We will then move on to comments from the public. I'm going to jump up to the podium. Just state your name and the town of residence, please. Um, I'm Allison Bergis, and I live in Hillsdale. Oh. On that. Okay, it's on, right? Okay. Um, I'm Allison Varghese, and I um, live in Hillsdale. I am a student of Prospect Valley, and the mascot was brought up today. I didn't plan on speaking at all. But this Allison, I'm sorry. Can you can maybe you can take the microphone off the stand and, and speak into it? I'm sorry. It's just a little it's bit okay. hard to hear you. Thank <laughs> um, you. I wasn't planning on speaking today, um, but the mascot was brought back up. Um, as a student at Pascac Valley who um, isn't in the mascot committee, but has been involved um, with information and stuff like that, I, as a student, was given the impression that we were past this and because we talked about, you know, do the students realize that this is an option? I did not know that this is an option. And, you know, we talked about the offensiveness of this mascot. For me particularly, um, both of them um, don't sit right with me just because they personally offend me. I am a female and I would never be want to, you know, be called a cowboy as a girl, you know, because I don't think, you know, many um, boys would be happy to be called a cowgirl. You know what I mean? And um, as an Indian, I am Indian. Um, my father was born in India. And, you know, if our name was the natives, maybe, maybe I, I personally wouldn't have as much of a problem with it than being named the Indians because that isn't their true name. Um, and so I wouldn't have so much of a problem with it if maybe we were called the natives. Um, but then again, the people who, you know, the Native Americans that do live here do have a problem with, with you know, with uh, us being a mascot. And I feel like, you know, if we truly do want to represent the Native Americans, maybe we should be listening to them, right? More instead of how we feel. Um, and I think, you know, we also talked about the budget and stuff like that. You know, we talked about how, you know, the, the, end, the end zone will take longer time and this, and we talked about change, but if we wait another eight years, right? Like change takes time. But if you don't initiate it, it'll never start. And I mean, I want change. And I know there's plenty of other students who do want change. And if we wait, you know, till the turf or the wrestling mat starts smelling, like what is that gonna do? And, you know, we talked about how it's embarrassing as a school for um, 
you know, to have the Cowboys there or, you know, just to be named as the Pasca Kills. But it's more embarrassing to be representing something that you don't believe in or you find offensive. Nobody wants to represent something they don't believe in. Um, and that's just my perspective. Thank you, Allison. Callers from the public? Carolee Adams. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes, and um, for callers, can you please state your name and the town of residence, just for the record? Ali Adams, 50-year resident of Montvale. Uh, I will run through these topics and you can respond later if you wish. Number one, regarding assessments, uh, I think you're aware of the fact that the feds and the state have now stopped assessments because of COVID. They're not gonna do assessments, uh, number one. Number two, regarding the emails, um, not only does Montville's K-8 Board of Ed accept emails to individual board members, but so do the mayors of each town, as far as I know. And, uh, you know, I think it would be important for us to know who the committee members are, who are the chairs of them are, and that if we send an email to uh, an individual board member, and I have full faith and confidence in Claudia in being very fair about all of this, as she always has been, but that you can copy, put a CC to the entire board, but direct it to one individual board member. So I, I don't think it would be terribly, uh, since we have a mayor and council uh, that do it directly to individual members, uh, they have no problem with it. Our K-8 has no problem with it. Why not Pascack Valley Regional High School Board of Education? Uh, now, this is this is totally off the um, reservation, so to speak. But by the way, uh, Mrs. Bissinger, I have talked to a number of different girls in town. I do a lot of walking. I have a lot of young friends. They have no problem with being called cowboys, by the way. And I like very much what somebody said that instead of accentuating the negative, we accentuate the positives. And as uh, Mr. Weaver had given some positives about various cowboy organizations represented by some fabulous uh, selfless women. And now this is off, this is very different. Regarding our local volunteer ambulance corps, Triborough that covers two of our sending towns, Park Ridge and Hillsdale, uh, there is, I, I think that this is something that needs to be considered. We have several thousand new residents expected with all the buildings that are going on in our communities. And that I, these are volunteer ambulance corps, as far as I know, and that nine tenths of wisdom comes to being wise in time. And I don't think we're being wise in uh, bolstering our volunteer ambulance corps. So I'm, I'm doing a variety of different things about that. Number one, to encourage more volunteers, uh, both in our Boy Scout troops, our churches, anybody I talk to. Secondarily, though, I have learned that there is a limitation to EMTs uh, in that there are not enough courses offered, uh, there are not a, enough instructors offered. So I'm talking to state legislators about this, but I do understand that there are in the high schools the opportunity to train future EMT workers. I mean, it looks good on their resumes if they're going to go to college. But then again, I don't, I've been told that the summer courses, and you can correct me if I was wrong, I heard it from an EMT from another town, is that as soon as the courses are opened up to the students, they're closed down because they're very limited. So I wonder if there's something that we could do since I'm going to encourage other people, uh, other organizations, other groups to try and encourage additional volunteers for our volunteer corps, that you could do the same somehow or another, use your bully pulpits to encourage more young people to get involved and our parents as well too. Once again, 3000 new residents expected with all the buildings that I know of that are going on. How can we expect a volunteer ambulance corps to respond? And if we say, okay, well, we have a Valley Hospital ambulance corps going around. Well, they charge, they charge exorbitant fees while a volunteer ambulance corps, which by the way, operates, Tribor operates only on donations, which was news, new news to me. So I wonder if you can do something and uh, maybe talk to the school boards association to see whether or not we can, you can encourage on a different plane that there be more openings for high school students to actually be trained as EMTs and to bolster our, our ambulance corps. Um, 
but uh, that's that's totally different than anything you've discussed before. Um, I appreciate um, uh, I appreciate all that you do. I appreciate once again. I think it was Mr. Blundo. Maybe I'm wrong. Who said something? This this should have been discussed back in June. I know that it was me who brought it up about the cost, and that no one ever responded to me about that. And that had we all had that buttoned down a long time ago, we wouldn't be discussing it as we're discussing it today. And the students would be caught up in the mix. And there was a rally. Uh, I'm sure you know, Save the Cowboys rally, Pasco Hills High School. Uh, and 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 there were a lot of young girls there, and and they loved being called cowboys. They were. And and we even had the cooperation of some of those organizations that Mr. Weaver talked about. They would become, they would be glad to come and talk if the time allowed. This is, of course, with before COVID, to come and talk to some of the students about this. And Mrs. Molinelli, the last for you. When you talk about the tears of the students, oh come on, we know bullying. We know it's absolutely dreadful. And uh, and and I will tell you this. A lot of the tears that are happening now in our communities are the tears of households that don't have enough money to pay their bills because they're out of work. So how do these kids afford to go to college? Uh, you know, and I have to think we have to consider overall that there's a lot of depression happening. There's a lot of depression happening. Uh, people who just, um, you know, we're not allowed, we're not able to do the things we wanted to do because we can't afford it. So I would, I, I certainly had tears coming from my household with children being brought up and not getting all that they wanted or perhaps being bullied or maybe being discriminated against. Um, and I, I despise it to the core, but please let us respond, I think, to the overall populations that exist in our towns and the needs that they have for fiscal, fiscal strength. And our taxes, um, I know Montvale used to say we're washing money now. We don't have money this year. So any additional costs- Sorry to interrupt you, but you've got one more minute. You've gone over the allotted time. So if you could just um, wrap your comments up, we appreciate that. Once again, once again, it was about the assessments. I believe that they have been abandoned because of COVID, the students aren't ready for it. Number two, it's about the emails that I think there's no harm in having our ability to send it to individual board members with a copy to the entire board uh, and the volunteer ambulance corps. And once again, regarding costs, I think you have to be very, very careful about putting any more costs upon a very beleaguered um, citizenry that exists right now in this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other callers? Yes. Ms. Gross. Good evening, do you guys hear me? Yes, we do. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I know that there was a quote that was by Mark, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Cheryl Gross. I live in Rivervale and I am a parent and obviously a community member. And I know that there was a quote that was um, by Martin Luther King earlier, but I wanna provide another quote that says, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. And I believe that that is what these young people are doing. This is their mascot. Many of us, I am 54 years old. And one of the things as some board members talk about regret, what I regret as a parent and as a community member of the many parents who did not believe that the discussion about the mascot would go to this end, that we did not support our kids, that we did not come to school board members, that we did not raise our voice to say that this is their mascot and we trust and believe that as all time, as every life evolves, as we evolve as human, that the children wanted to choose something that is symbolic of them when they go out and represent the school. We are no longer representing the school in the same capacity as they do when they wear that uniform. And so that is my regret. And as a parent of a student of color who has in many other kids that I've had gone through the, through the school system and other children I know who have gone through the school system who have suffered tremendously with mental health issues and everything due to the lack of equity, inclusion and belonging that we, I only wish that we will spend this much time at another board member speaking about how we can make all of our students feel included. I also, as a lawyer and as a corporate executive for over 20 years, I also wish 
that we will spend this much time at another board member talking about preparing our children to compete in the society that they are coming into, to prepare them mentally, to give them coping skills, to teach them about globalization, to teach them about soft skills, and to teach them how to be resilient. That is what they're going to need in order to be successful in the society that they are entering. So in conclusion, I just wanna say, yeah, I have a regret. I have a regret that I did not come out earlier to speak about how I support these children in deciding how they want to represent themselves. The board made a decision. Now, some may not like it, and I understand that. There are decisions that I have to deal with every day when I go to work that I don't like. And then there are some decisions that are taken out of my hands because those decisions were made. But at this point, there's a course and I think we need to support these kids and make a decision and not to make them afraid, not to make them intimidated, but to empower them because that empowerment skill is what is going to make them so successful when they go out into the real world and they can take this experience of having a difficult issue, transcending it, making a decision and living with it. So that is what I wanna say as a parent and as a community member. And I thank you for your time and I thank you all for all your service. Thank you. Christy Levine. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kirsty Levine and I live in Rivervale and I have um, students in Pascack Valley High School. And I would like to, first of all, um, Thank you, say thank you to Mr. Blundo for raising the issue of our academic performance and some of the recent assessments um, that are of concern to, to many of us who have looked at them. Uh, I did send an email to the board but didn't receive a response. So I'm, I'm glad that to know that somebody actually read my email. Um, I, I would just like to mention that, you know, science isn't the only area that has fallen in, in recent years in our schools. I, I happen to just be bored at home during COVID because I can't go out. And uh, I was researching a lot of our trends and our performance levels uh, on the New Jersey Department of Education website, because as a lawyer, I, I look at the primary source um, data for my information. And I noticed that, you know, not only do our science scores uh, <clears throat> uh, come in much lower than our peer schools, but so did our math scores. Um, you know, in the most recent uh, published scores, uh, our surrounding towns, Ridgewood, Northern Valley, Demarest, Northern Highlands, Park Ridge, they're all in the 61 to 65% proficiency um, and Pascack Valley is in the 45% math proficiency. I, I, you know, I had a son who, who applied for colleges last year and, and I, he, math and science, and, and we, we can't have scores that are uh, this low in, in this type of neighborhood. You know, we pay an exorbitant amount in taxes. We all moved to these towns because the school systems were excellent. When I moved here, I think Hills was number two in the state school, not percentile, number two school, and Valley was, I think, number 26. Um, you know, they're nowhere near those numbers now. And I understand that teaching to the test is not the way uh, to go all the time, but but our kids need to have math and science proficiency. Um, it's just these these numbers are way too low, and I, I urge this board to look at what may be the cause and to come up with you know a plan of action to fix this. I as a parent that sends my kids to the public schools, other than their safety and well being, um, emotionally and, and physically and mentally, um, academics really should be the top priority of, of a public school, of the administration, the board, uh, you know, not politics. They, 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 they we, we need to leave politics out of the school, encouraging kids to do certain, you know, political endeavors. I, I, I think there's a little too much of that these days. Um, you know, I, I agree there is a place for it and, and there are many non-academic items that need to be brought into the school, but I really think academics other than health and safety, really needs to be at the top here. Um, and, and I really urge this board to, to focus on that. And I hope that that will be an item going forward. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. I know that Dr. Gunderson is going to be working with the head of curriculum to take a look at that. And the, this board will be reviewing uh, not just science and math, but um, everything across the board. So I uh, thank you for that comment. Councilman Roche. Hi, Councilman Roche from Montville. I just wanted to comment on Ms. Bassinger's um, in the inequity. I'm just wondering as far as I believe in one of the previous um, meetings, it was the, it was mentioned about 30 or 40 percent felt that uh, 30, 40 percent of the students felt that there was an inequity in how they were treated. I'm wondering if if it was just like a one time thing or is that a constant? Um, I know prior to the Board of Ed building coming down, there was the swap ball team was going up to La Trenta Field where the boys team got to practice at Hills. Um, yes, that's been resolved. Uh, you also have the football team. If the, if the boys or girls soccer team has a game and the football team is practicing at the same time, it's automatic that the football team gets the turf. The soccer teams go to the grass fields. Um, another bigger issue that I currently have is my daughter's on the varsity soccer team. At Pascat Kills, all of the boys teams received Pascat Kills Gators as masks this past fall. None of the girls teams received those. So that's some of the, and I'm sure there's many more examples. These are just, you know, my, my kids play one sport. I have a, <laughs> a son who plays soccer, a daughter who plays, or I have four kids, two and two, but two are at Hills, boy and a girl. One, they both play soccer. That's pretty much their, the extent of their activities. But these are some of the other things that have come up in conversation with other parents. So, you know, I think going forward, yes, some things do take time to, you know, resolve themselves out. And the Trenta was a sticking point when it did come up. It did get resolved, I guess. It's, you know, at some point, and these things don't happen overnight. But I'm just wondering, as far as feeling the inequity, was it, well, I don't want to be called the cowgirl or a cowboy, or I'm just wondering how much of that was directed towards the mascot and how much was directed towards the students' feelings in general if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. The survey is an ongoing kind of living, breathing metric for us moving forward. And while over the last several years, we've done surveys for to our student body and to the, the administration and community, it, it's not really a moment in time. I think it's a trend that we've seen over the last several years and we continue to keep our eye on it just based on surveys and institutional feedback and and you know through the clubs and such and the uh, the board saw the the quantitative results of the student climate surveys um, but annually we have students uh, provide feedback to a writing prompt that has to do with inclusivity and, and equity um, and today our staff members spent um, a good portion of today reading their own students thoughts and feelings as it pertained to those writing prompts so the board the old board had access to read those responses of students. And I think it would probably be valuable for this new board to see the responses from oh, students so for this year as well. So all new, all board members, it will be brand new. I had the opportunity to read some today um, and it was brand new to me as well. So it is important to um, Councilman Roche's point to see what happens over time, which is why we're not getting rid of the student equity survey. It's important to see that we are hopefully making improvements over time. And Councilman Roche mentioned some of those improvements that we've made, um, but clearly there's always room for improvement. Always. Anyone else on our calls? Mm -hmm. Laura uh, Pirados, did I pronounce that correctly? And I'm sorry, I think inadvertently uh, I may have lowered your hand before, so I'm glad that you raised it again. Thank you. Hi, yes, Laura Parados, Montvale. I would like some clarity, please, regarding how the students are selected for the committee in Hills. Valley seemed to be pretty clear in how the students were selected, but Hills did not seem as clear. So the students were selected uh, by the athletic director, reaching out to each of the individual coaches and advisors that were going to be representing um, 
that we're going to have representatives on this committee. So the coaches were tasked with um, reaching out to the students and the athletic directors, I believe, ensured that there was um, equal representation across grade levels, genders, and different activities. So uh, the athletic directors did not choose the students. It was more of a process of the individual coaches and advisors. Were there representatives from every club and sport the way Valley had expressed? A good cross-section of those uh, organizations, yes. I, I'm not going to say that each and every sport and club, uh, just because I didn't specifically ask that question, but I do know that there's a, uh, a strong cross-section. Just it was a little disheartening to hear that a student had stated that um, he was surveying his friend group, but you know, if you're not in his friend group, perhaps you may not have a voice then. Well, the hope is that, and what the students are tasked with, and this is what I'd ask the students to um, clarify a little bit more, that they were go, to go and interact with the students in their particular sport, in their particular um, co-curricular activity, and the hope was that we would get enough conversation taking place that we would be able to generate some ideas. All students will have a voice through the voting process. After the three are selected, though, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So they, then initially, not all students would potentially have a voice unless they're connected directly to those 30 or so students. We were trying to get as much interaction between students as possible. If you know of um, any students that are hoping to provide their thoughts, that uh, they should reach out to Mr. Pospalis or Mr. Buchanan or any building administrator, and they will certainly put that student in touch with one of the student representatives on that group. And do the students know to do that? I don't know. I that can find be out. I to know because there are many children that maybe don't have that voice. I would suggest that if you come across any students that are not aware of their opportunity to, to speak to, um, to a fellow classmate, that they, uh, that they seek out the building principal or athletic director. And I will remind the, uh, the principals and athletic directors to put the word out. I would think that would be something that would come from the administration rather than a parent who only has access to, you know, maybe a couple, you know, some students. Look, we can go back and forth. You're more than welcome to call me tomorrow if you'd like to discuss this further. And I can put you directly in touch with the principal of the building that you're referring to. Thank you for your feedback. Um, do we have any other callers? Not right now. We'll give everybody another 30 seconds. Okay, if you would like to make a comment, if you could just please indicate that by star nine or raising your hand on the Zoom call. We have one here in person. Oh, Mr. DeRosa. <laughs> it's the in-person <laughs> component <you>. again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're a lively bunch tonight. You just gotta jump up and grab the mic. It's hard to see me in the crowd. <laughs> uh, Listening to your conversation about communication specific to the emails, um, you know, and, and considering it from my point of view as a council member, if a resident sends me an email, I feel an obligation to reach out to that person, either by email or telephone call a lot of times. Um, if, an, if a resident sends an email to mayor and council, um, you know, it's more of a general email, but still sometimes I'll reach out to that resident. We're all elected officials, and I would submit that our obligation is actually to respond to it to a resident if they reach out to us. I don't know, I think I do know, but I don't know that there's anything, any difference between the board's um, responsibilities and mayor and council when it comes to responding to residents' uh, inquiries. So I, I, I think you have the right person in charge of uh, the communications committee, Mr. Blundo. I hope you reconsider the policy that you have. Yeah, so there is a difference between board members and, and council members. You're right, they are both elected officials. Uh, the protocols for board members, and that, that is not just for this Board of Education, this is for the New Jersey right. School Board Association, which is to, when a, when a member of the public comes up to a board member to issue a complaint or has a question, the board member is to refer that member of the public to the superintendent. And then the board member is to notify the superintendent also that they had a question or complaint and that way it gives the superintendent an opportunity to solve the problem, address the complaint, and then interact with that person or delegate that interaction to a member of the administrative team. 
board members individually are not supposed to try to take care of business, if you will. So first of all, God bless you, because everything goes back to you. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. <laughs> but I, 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 at the very least, I would imagine, I would think that a, an individual board member could at least acknowledge it. Uh, you know, I'd say I pass it on to the superintendent. And that's one of the things that we'll have to talk about in the communications committee. Right. Also, after speaking with the representative from New Jersey school boards to find out from his perspective, what are the best practices that he's seeing across the, the county and across the state? Yeah. OK, good. Thank you. I, I think the other thing that feels a little bit different is we are a, a non-political organization. <laughs> so we are nonpartisan, where when you find most municipalities, you will find that there is generally a different system. There's Democrats, Republicans, whatever configuration you want. Yeah. Um, and I think that adds just a little bit of a different dynamic. The thing uh, that is important, and I will, I will, you know, if I see somebody in ShopRite and they ask me a question, I will absolutely refer them to Dr. Gunderson. Um, and I think the other, the caveat for me is that when a student has an issue and they approach me directly, I refer them directly to Dr. Gunderson, and I know that he will re he will respond to every single student personally and directly if they reach out for him. So there is a different caveat about the, the way that that works, and I think we can provide some written confirmation and, and just a little okay. bit about uh, the uh, details of how school boards are different than, say, a local municipality. Right. I just don't see how the politics works into that. If you're an elected official, you, re you represent residents, uh, period. I, I just don't. Um, but it sounds as though other boards, you know, have adopted different, and it sounds like you're looking into it with uh, some uh, council and guidance. But I think uh, I would urge you to consider that's more correct, open and that is why the communications committee was established because we recognize that there are perhaps uh, better ways to operate and communicate with the public at large, individuals from the community, and also make sure that this board is able to operate in a proper fashion. Right. So Understood. we will do a better job of, of communicating that to the general public as well. What are the roles and responsibilities of board members and how does that differ from other elected officials? All right. And, and if that's the case, then perhaps it's a standard, you know, email uh, uh, signature at the end of the email that explains why, you know, the candidate, the candidate, the uh, commissioner board member, excuse me, <laughs> couldn't respond. Uh, it just, it, from a resident's point of view, and, and we all deal with optics and perspective and, and perceptions, to have an email just go into a, a seemingly a black hole and be ignored is, is kind of insulting. But, and I don't mean to, to contradict what you're saying because you bring up valid points. The statement that has been an, uh, the automatic reply of the Board of Education has stated, I believe quite clearly, that each of the board members receives the email, each of the board members reads the email, and in the latest version that we put in that automatic reply, it was to remind people that this is talked about, but individual board members can't reply on behalf of the board. Yeah. So we'll, we'll refine the process. I okay. think it's something that we, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing other people, that it's something that as a board, we need to focus on to make sure that every board member understands what their roles and responsibilities are, and equally important, Residents right. understand what the roles and responsibilities are of board members. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. We do have another comment from phone number. Last four digits are seven nine one three. Hi. Hi, Yale Glazer Montel. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that that name? Yeah. Yale Glazer from Montvale. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so a couple quick points. Um, you know, it's kind of disheartening to hear uh, Mr. Blundo and some of the others who are now taking the position that, you know, we, we, we wish we could have done this when. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, uh, we wish, you know, things would have happened the way they are. Um, I think what Mr. Weaver was saying, uh, his point – it's great. Unfortunately, I, I think the ship has sailed, Mike, that um, I, I think that the kids are already making decisions. Um, and uh, again, I, as I stated back in June, I don't have a personal preference on cowboys, cowgirls. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not from here. Um, uh, I, I think it would be a little more confusing to say to them now, you can go back to cowboys and cowgirls. Um, a couple issues with that. I'll throw my questions out and then I'll, I'll be done with that. Um, 
if, if we if we decide to make the change, I agree with Mike. We got to do it now because you have several issues that are going to come up. First of all, you have someone who says if it's really that uncomfortable about being a cowboy or a cowgirl, but they're on JV and they've got to wear a cowboy or a cowgirl piece of clothing, that's not fair to that student. So how can you say, okay, everyone else is the wildebeest, but you still have to be a cowboy or cowgirl? And the other issue is, I don't know how this is going to shake out in modern day, but cowboy, cowgirl, that assumes there is a gender of a boy or a girl. And as we all know, I believe kids are nowadays picking any gender they want, or maybe a they, and not being a, a he or a she. So I don't really know how that's going to work out mechanically if, if, the, uh, if the ultimate mascot is a male or a female mascot. Um, as to the email addresses, I think you have a Freedom of Information Act issue if you have people using personal emails. So I really think you need to have individual emails for those individuals so people aren't ending uh, Freedom of Information Act subpoenas for their personal email. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is the inequality issue. And it's got nothing to do with being a cowgirl. It's, it's offensive to even say that. The, 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 the gender, I have, I have a daughter that plays two sports in the school. And, you know, you look at the issues of when a boy makes player of the week in the, in the Bergen record, he gets put in the, in, in the school paper. But if my daughter had to go complain to the person in charge of the paper and say, hey, you know, we had a female basketball player last week was player of the week. How come there was no mention of her? And then you have issues with the cross girls cross country team for two years wins the counties, yet nothing gets put on the wall about them. But football or basketball on the boys' side breeds, and there's things about them. That goes directly to Pat's palace and the administration of the schools. It's a gender inequality thing. It's always boys. It's always football, and that's just wrong. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you right. for your comments. Okay. Seeing no more uh, comments, is there any additional thoughts from our colleagues before we close our meeting tonight? I did have one follow-up question on the vote, after, and I don't know if we know the answer, but after the three are selected, are faculty voting or just students? Just students. Okay, I was asked that question. I forgot to ask it. And just a little comment on the EMT situation that Ms. Adams brought up. My wife, for maybe six years, was the uh, captain of the Rivervale Ambulance Corps, and we had a lot of kids join, and sometimes a kid from Hillsdale would join Rivervale because it worked out better and vice versa. And it's great, but what happens is it's a lot of investment in the students, and it's great for the student. They train a lot, and then they go off to college. So while it's very good, and I agree with Ms. Adams in encouraging getting youth to participate, and I wouldn't do anything less, I don't know if it solves the problem. That's just personal experience. Agreed. Uh, and, and I think uh, this... Num the members, members of the board that have been on the board for a little while know that uh, Dr. Backenheimer, who is uh, a volunteer EMT himself and a lieutenant on his local uh, volunteer fire department, advocates strongly as well for volunteering in an emergency type of role. And so he's the one that brought the initiative to the district to make sure that every student was trained in CPR. Now, granted, not this year because we can't train in CPR this year. Um, but until this year, every student was trained in CPR. And as part of that, they do emphasize the importance of volunteering in, in your community if you can and if you're interested in doing that. And I also believe Dr. Backenheimer did some work in our PASCAC period, uh, Learn to Learn program with uh, providing opportunities for students to learn a little bit more about what it is to be an EMT. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank all my colleagues tonight. I think we had some robust conversations. We shared some very differing points and opinions, and that's really what it's all about, is to agree to disagree. And we're all here. We were all elected to be able to share what we think, uh, what we believe in, and, and we'll work together as a team for the best interest of our kids. So with that being said, I'd like a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. By acclamation, we are adjourned. <laughs>